forward right now, just to capture the little preamble uh, before our class begins, and so that I don't forget to click it later. Yeah, so anyways, the official textbook is, hello there, Michaela. Hi. Welcome to our party. And Amber, hi Amber. How's hi, good, how are you? Good, thanks for sharing some video because I don't really know any of you yet and it's good to like have a face to put to your names. It's gonna, I'm usually hard at learning names in the best of circumstances. So this is gonna be an interesting challenge. I've never taught a course completely online before. I mean, I, I did last semester halfway through and it was pretty fine, but I already kind of knew everyone beforehand. So this is gonna be interesting to see what how this goes. Anyways, I was just yapping while we're waiting yapping. for you to join us. And Yanita, there is a book for this course. It's called The Cosmic Perspective. Okay. You can get the entire text, or you can get the Solar System Edition. But honestly, if, if times are tough, because I know that times are tough for people out there, um, you might be able to just wing it without a book. That could be kind of scary. That might be a little bit like, you know, doing the tightrope without the safety net, especially during exam time, that, that might be scary. But I'm going to try to provide you with the questions that we're doing for homework. I'm scanning this book and I'm putting it up on Blackboard. Well, not the whole book. I'm scanning like the question section. Um, and I'm scanning the, there's a lab book too, but don't buy that. Hold on. Let me get all the materials out. Okay. The lab book, I'm going to have to go over this again once everyone shows up, but the lab book is the, whoop, the Wilson Astronomy Lab Manual. But this thing is kind of like no longer in print. So what I'm doing is I'm scanning the pages that we need to work on for our lab and I'm uploading them to our Blackboard page. Let me give you guys a little tour. Obviously you guys must have figured some of this out, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I can share my screen with you. And here we are now, if you can see my computer. You all see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. So here's our course, Summer 2020, Astronomy 1010, the solar system. Uh, while you're waiting for class to start, you don't necessarily need to print it, although you can. But if you go to syllabi and schedules, uh, just open up the embedded pages here so that you'll be able to follow along. If you want, you can open up a couple of lecture notes. Today, we're going to cover lecture zero and lecture one, if we're lucky. Those are just little document files. You can open those up. And if you want to get real cray and you want to follow along with the lectures, lecture zero, uh, sorry, if you want to follow along with the PowerPoints, lecture zero and lecture one are the PowerPoints that I'm going to be clicking through. You'll be able to see it because I'll share my screen with you. But if you want to, I don't know, download it for yourself, you can. Um, we're going to be doing a lab today. And you can see that here's our lab, lab one powers of 10. And we need a couple of pages from the Wilson Astronomy Lab Manual. And I've provided them for you here as a PDF. So if you click on this bad boy, boom, you can open this up. We're just going to be doing three pages today, but that'll take some time. Um, and you can either print this if you have a printer and then write on it. And then when it's time to submit it, you'll be able to take a cell phone picture or if you're like kind of a computer whiz and you want to edit the PDF directly, you can do that, but we're going to have rules about how your math formats look like. I'm going to talk to you about that. So don't get too scared yet. We'll get into that. Anyways, the point is, you need to, I'm trying to long windedly answer your, Oh, look, there's more of people here now. Hello, Ryan. How's that morning cup of Joe treating you? Good. Good. Okay, good. I had five cups of coffee, so I'm going to be on fire today. Okay. All right. In fact, I might even go for number six before class starts. All right. Uh, anyway, so please, you might want to get this handy. Hey, do you guys have scientific calculators floating around your apartments? Somewhere. If not, you're going to use your phone or something. You will eventually buy this calculator. It costs $8. I'll be talking about that in a moment. But if you have a calculator around, go fish that thing out. It'll be helpful, especially if it's a scientific calculator. If not, you can... I think you can turn your iPhone sideways if you have an iPhone and use a, get a scientific calculator app. Uh, let's see how many peeps we got with us here. I was just sharing my screen and tell, hello, Zach. Hi, how are you? 
Thank you so many of you for sharing some video because I want to get to know your faces, especially on this first day. We got a few seconds before class starts. Wait, I think our class list is maybe 14 people. So I want to try to get as many of you guys in here before we launch into it. Let me just look at my uh, class list here. So my class list. Summer 2020. We should get to be 14 people. So everybody that showed up, um, you gave them 10 points um, for attendance? Uh, kind of, but it's a little different than that. Uh, you get your points doing work. But we're going to do a lot of the work together. So I don't like to think of it as an attendance thing because I'm going to actually make you submit something. And if the something that you submit is all effed up, then you won't be getting your 10 points. Oh, but okay. as long as you're a good little cookie and you show up and you kind of follow the bouncing ball and write down all the things I tell you to write down, then yeah, you'll be able to get your 10 points and it will almost be like attendance. But you're going to have to do something for me and I'll be explaining that in gruesome detail once we get a few more cats here in the, in the playpen. Uh, but, but attendance isn't gonna happen for the lecture, but you kind of just need to be here. It, you know, summer classes are intense. We're gonna be spending some time together every Monday and Wednesday. You guys, your lives are mine. Uh, Monday, Wednesday day until the end of this thing. But we will have as much fun as we can. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you. So that's a little more than half the class. Uh, okay, yeah, so um, while we're waiting for more, uh, I'm recording this, by the way, so that if anyone misses, oh, hello there. Tess, welcome to the class. Good morning, or good afternoon. Um, the, you can definitely get through this class without buying the lab book. You maybe could even get through this class without the textbook if you are a very careful note taker and you write down everything you're going to see me write down on the board. You might be able to wing through it. <clears throat> Although, of course, the textbook provides all this extra detail and graphics and imagery that'll help you follow along. So, oh, hello, Megan. Oh no, Megan, we lost your face. Hi. <laughs> hey, hi. How you doing? <clears throat> Welcome to our class. I'm doing good. Okay. How are you? Um, I'm on five cups of coffee, so I'm ready to go. Soon to be six, actually. There's That's a sixth great. one brewing stage right. So. Well, I have the mirror screen on, so I'm just seeing which direction is right on, on my screen here. Okay, never mind. Hey, so this is what you guys need to get. Let's see if we get the camera to focus on this. On this. Message for you. The Casio FX260 solar calculator. Available at Staples. Available at Walmart. And everywhere that calculators are sold. It costs eight bucks. That's less than the price of a pack of smokes. And you guys can discover all sorts of secrets of the universe right here with your handy uh, scientific calculator. Now, the reason why we're all going to want that same calculator is because probably nobody knows what they're doing. And so it's going to be a lot easier for me to tell you which buttons to push if we all have the same calculator. So if you're planning on doing anything for this course at all, go to Staples, go to Walmart, today before next class and get one of these. In the meantime, if you, have, um, if you have a scientific calculator or any kind of crappy calculator handy, you're gonna need that for today. You got that, Nick Cunningham? I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you directly. I got that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just eating a home fry. That's my bad. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, share with the class. You want to see I mean, fry. I can. I got pancakes too, if anybody's interested. 
right. <laughs> okay. I think we've almost one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have ten out of fourteen. That's pretty good. We'll just we'll start a couple of minutes here. Uh, those of you who joined us after the initial volley of people, feel free to download the syllabus um, from the Blackboard site. You can just have it on your screen in the background so that when I go over, you can look at it in detail. Uh, that's located on the syllabus tab in Blackboard. If you follow my screen, click on syllabi and schedule and click that guy and click that guy. And you should see something that looks normally at the beginning of every class. Oh, hold on. I got to get my syllabus out. This reminds me. So. CCY, summer 1010 syllabus. So normally at the beginning of every class, I hand out this thing. This, thing. this is for y'all to look at. We're going to cover this in the opening moments of our class. That's our syllabus. And then perhaps the most important document is the schedule, which helps us keep track of our homework assignments and our labs and all the things we'll do each class. I've got all the dates labeled here. Um, <clears throat> somewhat less useful, but a little bit useful are my Roman numeral style outline lecture notes. This is just a kind of overview, a top-down overview of some of the things I want to cover today. It's not a complete set of notes. It's just a guide to, so you can follow kind of where we are in the structure of things. And those pups are located under lecture notes in your Blackboard right here. I've actually got all of them up for the entire course. Okay, so. I think we're going to get started here soon, but there's one last thing to do uh, before we begin our class, and this is what we're going to do every day, and that is we're going to play the class intro. Get ready. Hello, space fans, and welcome to Professor Britton's Wacky Universe. Okay, if that doesn't set the tone, I don't know what will. <laughs> Welcome, space fans, to a and ten. Okay. Um, and a big shout out to my buddy Mark, who helped me make that awesome intro to the course. Wow, that All right, rules. we got uh, seven, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got ten out of fourteen people, which ain't so bad. Oh my gosh! And look at this coffee delivered right to my screen. Hmm. <laughs> This is going to help. Ah, yes. Okay. Now that we've got this elixir, uh, it's time to get started in our class. Uh, before we get into anything, I want to thank you so many of you for sharing your, um, your little faces with me so that I can learn who you are and get to know you. Brandon, Ian, Michaela, Amber, Zach, Tess, Megan, Ryan. Uh, a good strategy for Zoom etiquette that I've been learning as I go, because this is only the second time I've done an online course, is it's a good idea to kind of mute yourself, but don't let that stop you from participating. Just anytime you want to make a comment, uh, unmute and say your thing and then mute again. I may violate those rules a little bit since I'm the teacher and I've got to do a lot of talking, but the muting is just a good way to cut down on some of the background noise. So if your dog barks or something, we, if you have a dog, we want to see it, of course, in the camera because dogs are cute and cats are cute. 
So show us all your wacky animals in your little barnyard there, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but maybe mute until it's time to talk. That'll kind of cut down on the ambient noise a bit. Okay, uh, before we start talking about any crazy stuff uh, having to do with the class, uh, I want to begin uh, by uh, asking you guys a couple of questions here. So I should be sharing my screen with you, function F5. Uh, nope, I don't think I am. Let me try that again. Share screen, bada boom, and now I'm going to do function F5. Okay, can you guys see this slide here that I'm starting off with? This is the thing that we got to talk about before we talk about anything else. Astronomy versus astrology. My first question to you guys is, do you know anything about these two things and what the difference is between astronomy and astrology? Megan, what about you? Do you know, you know what astronomy is? Do you know what astrology is? Well, I don't really know. I mean, I know astronomy is like, you know, planets and like the sky, you know, whatnot. True. But I don't really know much about it. And then astrology, I obviously know my sign and that's about it. Okay. Well, but that's something, right? So astrology has got to do with your signs. Astronomy has got to do with stars and planets. But the signs thing has to do with planets too, right? I know this because when I'm out drinking at the bar or when I used to go out drinking at the bar before the world went to hell, then people would ask me what my sign was and they'd be telling me about how, you know, Capri Sun was in Gatorade or whatever. And I couldn't, you know, they'd tell me that, that Mercury was retrograde. So I know that astrology has something to do with planets. Um, does anyone else know the difference between those two things? This is a kind of, this is a talk we've got to have. How about Amber? Amber, you look like someone who's, Dying to make a comment. <laughs> I have no clue, honestly. All right. Okay. Well, then, you know what? <clears throat> let me show you guys what I think, okay? Uh, let, me, let me show you what I think here in my slideshow. So the, this is a picture of what your everyday astrologer looks like, okay? This is a picture of an astrologer. They, they tend to look like this. And when you talk to astrologers, the message that they have for you goes like this. Everything's going to be great. You will be rich. Okay. So that's what, that's what astrologers say. Now, on the other hand, let me show you a picture of what astronomers look like. They look like this. Okay. This is a famous astronomer known as Edwin Hubble, and he discovered that the universe was expanding. Now, the message of astronomers are a little bit different than the message of astrologers. They go like this. We're all going to die when the sun enters its red giant face. And that's, of course, because the sun will swell to such a profound radius that it will swallow up Mercury, Venus, and possibly even Earth. So you'll notice that the message of astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message of astrology. That's the first major difference, okay? Now, um, <clears throat> you can learn about these things um, in different types of magazines and periodicals. Uh, you can learn about astrology uh, in your local supermarket magazine aisle while you're waiting to check out the frozen peas, okay? And you can get a book like this, Dell Horoscope, and it has all sorts of things to tell you, like uh, Uranus moves into Pisces. Expect the unexpected, okay? Who would, who would not expect the unexpected? Any case, uh, you know, there's all kinds of interesting things in this magazine to tell you, like, you know, I don't know, love is waiting for you right around the corner in aisle five, or perhaps it's time to sell your condo in Florida. I don't know. Uh, if you want to read about an astronomy article, then you'd want to check out a magazine that looks a little more like this. This is what's called a peer-reviewed journal, like Science or Nature or the Astrophysical Journal. First thing you're going to notice is that this magazine over here on the right Oh, by the way, I can draw on these things, and I sometimes like to do that. This magazine is slightly more expensive uh, than the one over here on the left. Um, this magazine here costs about $2.50, or you can read your local astrology column in your Providence Journal or whatever. But to get a subscription to a magazine like this, you're going to have to pay a little bit more, probably a few hundred dollars per year for a subscription. And let me tell you, you kind of get what you pay for, like the the quality of the information in this magazine is just a little bit richer than the one on the left here. First of all, uh, science is a peer-reviewed journal. 
And that means if, if you're going to come up with your cockamamie theory of the universe and you want to publish it in science, first of all, you got to go out and do stuff, right? You got to go out to your telescope and you got to collect some photons and do a statistical analysis. And then before you can publish it, you have to submit this article to a body of enemy professors who are out to get you. They're sort of like your colleagues, but they're mean and they don't like you very much. And you have to anonymously let them review it to see it. You know, they'll go through the whole thing looking for errors or mistakes. And once they've gone cover to cover over it, they'll say, well, you know, the theory is misguided, of course, but I suppose there's nothing technically wrong with the research. Then they allow you to publish in, in this magazine here. Now, on the other hand, to publish an article in this astrology magazine, I'm not exactly sure what you got to do. Like, I imagine that this some person walks into the editor's office with an energy crystal on their forehead and says, bro, I am deeply in touch with the stars. And then the editor's chomping on a cigar and says, you hired 50 cents a word, your deadline's due on Monday. Like, I don't know how that works, but I don't think it's peer reviewed. <laughs> in any case, uh, people get these things confused all the time. And that's because they kind of have to do with the same sorts of things. Uh, let's, let's click the slide here. Here's a picture of your horoscope. Uh, you guys recognize this? This is your signs, right? Uh, who was I talking to earlier? I'm still learning your names. I was talking to uh, Megan. Your signs, Megan. So Aquarius, Pisces, Capricorn, Cancer, and of course, the 13th zodiac sign, Ophiuchus. Well, uh, these are actual real constellations in the sky, but there's only 13 here. I don't suppose any of you eager beavers know how many constellations there are in total. Hi, Esperanza, nice, nice to see you as well in our class. Uh, I'm just giving shout outs here like they do on YouTube. Okay, so anyways, <laughs> uh, how many constellations are in the total nighttime sky? The, what do they call it? The celestial sphere. I've got one right up here. This is a model. This here is a model, stop share, of our entire global sky. This is a celestial sphere. And this is sort of like what constellations you will see if you look out in any direction from Earth. One of our labs is going to be us exploring this thing together. Anyone know how many constellations are in the nighttime sky? I didn't think so. That's why you paid me to find out. There's 88, okay? Let's take some notes. We should do this sometimes. All right, I'm gonna not knock over my coffee because I need this. You guys wanna take, you guys got notebooks and pens and stuff? Now look, you don't gotta take notes, but if you wanna take notes, that might be a good idea, especially if you're not planning on buying the book. Um, those of you who are new to Zoom, just actually, can I see a show of hands? How many people have used Zoom for another class before? I want to see what I'm dealing with here. Two, three, four. But not even half of you. Oh, Yanita, you've, seen, you've used Zoom before? Okay. Up in the yeah. right-hand corner, there's a button. You can click between speaker view and presenter view. Uh, it's, it looks like a bunch of dots. And when you go to speaker view, if you double-click me, Oh, I just double clicked Zach for some reason. Hey, now if I double click me, I will be blown up on the screen and that way you can see my notes better, okay? So we're doing a little tidbit here on astronomy versus astrology, okay? And let's start by considering stars or let's start by considering constellations because they're in there. There are a total of 88 constellations in the nighttime sky. Can you guys see my notes okay? If you have trouble reading something that I write, you just got to shout out at me, okay? Don't. Yeah, I can't see um, clear. Oh, you cannot? No, um, maybe you could, like, I don't know, zoom in a little bit. Uh, so part of the issue is m I'm using a Logitech webcam, which is attached to my laptop, which is on top of a box. Okay, so um, <laughs> I can try to zoom in a little bit, but I also want you to be, I need to be able to like shimmy in and out of here. Okay, this, this is, um, are you working on a laptop or a phone, Yanita? 
um, a phone, but I could um, get on my tablet as well. Yeah, I think that might help, but are you in speaker view or gallery view? I don't know how it works on a phone. Um, I don't know what you mean. Do you, okay, do you see everybody's face all at once equally, or is my face uh, big? No, I have to swipe left to see everybody's face, but I okay. can only see you. So you want to swipe to where I am as big as possible. On a, on a, on a computer, you double click me and I'm enlarged. Hold on a second. Part of it is also my autofocus. So you can't read this very well. I don't know if I can write much bigger. Perfect. Okay, good. Versus, there are 13, we call them zodiac constellations. Now listen, students, the zodiac constellations are real constellations. They're not fake constellations. I wonder why astrologers only care about 13 when there's 88 constellations. Everyone cares about Sagittarius. Everyone cares about Capricorn. Why doesn't anyone care about Vulpecula? Why doesn't anyone care about Camillo Pardalis? These are awesome constellations worthy of our consideration. Um, it has to do with, now, in astronomy, we study all kinds of things, right? We study stars. We study planets. We study galaxies. Hell, we even study the whole damned universe. But astrology is not exactly a study of stars and planets and galaxies and universe. Astrology has a different premise. The premise is that the constellation in which the sun is found is going to determine your future or your personality type. And here I might want to make use of, let me share my screen with y'all. And let me go to slide 51 for just a hot minute here. F5, 51. Take a look at this diagram here. You can see a model of Earth shown in blue going around the sun shown in yellow. And because the Earth's orbit is a quasi circle, and because that circle more or less keeps the same orientation over, hell, billions of years, we see the sun projected against 13, formerly 12, but now 13 hyper specific constellations. These are the constellations of the zodiac. And that's why they were special to astrologers of old, because the sun went through them throughout the year. And you guys know the sun is like Ra. He's like our energy god, right? So if the sun travels through these 12 constellations, why, that must mean they are significant or important in some way. And they are. The sun travels through them. It helps us orient ourselves in the sky. Just so that you can understand what the astrologers are peddling you, Let's make sure we understand the central premise of astrology together. Uh, hopefully you guys can read all this. This is the premise. It's that the location of the sun against the background stars, the location of the sun against the background stars. Now here's the most important part, so get ready. On your B day, and that's your birthday, okay? The location of the sun against the background stars on your B day will determine your personality type and or your destiny. Holy shit. Your whole destiny is going to be determined by where the sun is against the background stars on your B-Day. You guys got that there? Now, here's there's a couple of issues here that we might want to address, okay? There is a difference between the physical and the metaphysical world. The physical universe are things that you can 
you know, taste and touch, things that you can smell, things that you can cook up in an Erlenmeyer flask. Meth is uh, part of the physical universe, okay? But other things like your soul and the spirits, those are part of the metaphysical universe. Those are things that you can't cook up in an Erlenmeyer flask, okay? Now, the sun, I hate to tell you this, but the sun is a physical object. Not only does it radiate photons into our face every day and warm up the earth, but hell, you can reach out and taste the sun. Check this out. Have you guys ever heard of the Parker Solar Probe before? In the Parker Solar Probe, our latest uh, spacecraft to explore the sun, the Parker Solar Probe is currently on an orbital trajectory where it will be sent flying through the outer atmosphere of the sun so it can sample plasma particles in the outer uh, portions of the sun. So we're actually sending a spacecraft through the outer layers of the sun to scoop up gas and plasma. That means in a way we can sort of touch the sun if you think about it. Um, let's talk about stars. Stars are physical objects. We haven't figured out how to fly to the stars yet, but we know they're physical because not only can we see them, but we can analyze the starlight and determine the chemical compositions of these stars. Oh, welcome, Ian, to our, our solar system party here. Oh, no, Ian, you've been here. I just didn't realize it was you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying. This is my way of learning your name, so you have to forgive me here. Um, okay. How about you? You're a physical person. You can be poked and prodded with needles and experimental apparatus. Your B-Day is kind of like a historical fact. That's on your birth certificate at the town hall. Now, here's where it gets a little bit squishier. Personality types are a little bit tougher to measure. But you know, there is a noble science of psychology where psychologists attempt to measure people's personality types. I don't know, with like a Miggs Breyer personality test. You know, you can ask a bunch of questions. Do you like puppies or do you like kitties? Do you like popsicles or do you like ice cream cones? And they filter you through some matrix and determine, oh, you're an alpha dog or you're a beta wolf. Now, I don't know how well that really describes people, but they're trying. You got to give it to the psychologists. They're trying to science, right? And, and so all of these things are things that you can attempt to measure. And what's interesting is if you go out and you measure people's personality types and especially wait till they die and check out their destiny, and you compare it to where the sun was uh, in the sky on their birthday, it turns out that this is, no kidding, this is a false statement. And that means that a careful study of, so let's just not be shy about this here, this statement is false. If you go out and measure a person's personality type and compare their destiny to where the sun was in their birthday, guess what? You've got nothing in common with Albert Einstein or Vincent Van Gogh. You just don't, okay? It doesn't matter if you were born on the same birthday. Uh, it's just not how it works, okay? Now, you, you might be a great scientist in your own right. That remains to be determined. But it's not because you were born on the same damn day as Sir Isaac Newton, okay? That's not what, how it works. Um, <clears throat> Because this statement is about physical things that do not hold up against self-scrutiny, we are not allowed to call astrology a religion. They don't have anything to do with metaphysical questions like where's the soul go when you die or something like that. Um, instead, philosophers have dubbed astrology to be a pseudoscience. A pseudoscience uses the technical mumbo jumbo and garbly gook that sounds quasi scientific, but ultimately makes false statements that do not hold up under self scrutiny that sort of, sort of compares them to their own uh, premises and, 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 and statements, right? So if I were to tell you that I was wearing a white shirt you can all clearly see I'm lying to you, right? I'm telling you a lie, as I will many times throughout the course of this semester. Okay, in any case, now that you understand a little bit about the, by the way, 
astrology would get pretty boring if they just left it as where the sun was on your B-day. That's your sun sign, right? You'd quickly realize that there are way more than 13 personality types on this great planet that we live on. So what they do is they throw in not just the sun, but they also throw in the moon and they throw in the planets too. And that, that's enough snake oil to keep you bamboozled for a long time. You know, it just so happens that we're both born in July, but guess what? My, my, I don't know, my Jupiter was in Virgo that day. So that's why I'm really funny at cocktail parties and you're a crashing boar that's no fun to be around. Okay, that's the kind of thing that they do there. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, let's take a look at some astronomy stuff. Let's see what the difference is here. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with you and we're gonna go back to our little slideshow here. Uh, bear with me while I figure out the technologies. Okay, this is what astronomers are interested in. Forget about like, you know, your neighbor Bob and what he bought at Target yesterday. This is the kind of thing that astronomers live for. This is what they want to study and understand. This is a famous iconis, iconic picture in astronomy. Does anyone know what the name of this picture is? I wanna see if we have any space fans in the audience here. Got any space fans? Oh, well, well, you know, there's a reason why you paid $500 to listen to me talk about space. It's because you don't know nothing about space, but you're gonna, okay? This famous picture here is called the Horsehead Nebula, so named because of the little seahorsey shaped cloud of hydrogen gas here. This is what the real universe is all about, kids. 99% of your universe is cold clouds of ionized hydrogen gas and hot spheres of plasma and dark, dusty nebulae. This is what the real universe is doing while you're sort of futzing around on the Nintendo, okay? And we should find out what's going on there when we look out into the nighttime sky because there's a whole lot more of this than there is of us. This is kind of like real reality and you constitute a sort of footnote to reality in comparison to the, the grandeur of this. In any case, now, <clears throat> I don't know what y'all plan on learning during the course of this online class, but I'd like you to start by learning one important lesson, and that's astronomy does not equal astrology. And if you write me an email and say, dear Professor Britton, I am in your astrology 1010 class, I'm gonna go delete, 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 and I'm gonna pretend like you never even appeared in my grade roster, okay? So don't talk to me about astrology. We're here to study astronomy and a particular branch of astronomy, the solar system. That's the class you just signed up for. And we're gonna be learning about all these beautiful planets that you see here. My other course, which is parallel to this one, covers stars and galaxies and black holes and fun stuff like that. But both courses are equally cool in their own right. And a nice thing about the solar system class is there's lots of nice pictures of planets for me to share with you. Okay, so if you don't know me by now, here's an action shot courtesy of the CCRI marketing department. Um, uh, this is, uh, my name is Brendan Britton. I've been teaching this class a long time. I'm an associate professor at CCRI. Um, here's a picture of me with the college's 16 inch schmidt cassegrain telescope. This is bigger than your average backyard telescope. It's something that only a serious amateur or a low grade professional would have. And it's so sad because I'm totally not going to get to take you to this thing during the course of the semester because of COVID-19. Uh, if restrictions start relaxing to the point where officials will allow us to go to campus together, um, then you can come to our observatory located in the backwoods of CCRI. Uh, I actually run it for the public every clear Wednesday night. And the way it works is if the skies are clear on Wednesday for the first two or three hours after dark, you can come by with your mom and your dad and your kid brother or whatever. And I kind of just like show you guys a bunch of different things, whatever's up in the sky, I show people planets, galaxies, um, planetary nebulae, whatever is cool. And it's kind of a good, fun, wholesome time that's totally free. And you should try to take advantage of that at some point. I haven't been open since the spring break of last semester after all this stuff went down. But uh, I'm hoping that sometime by the summer, they'll let me have people in there again. Uh, taking students out to this thing is one of my favorite parts of the course. 
So it's a little bit sad that, you know, we're only going to be interacting virtually because it would be cool to take you out and show you this stuff. But in any case, at some point, maybe after the class is over and restrictions are relaxed, you guys will be able to look through a telescope and it, it's really rewarding if you know a few things beforehand. Anyways, enough about me. Who are you? Well, obviously, I don't know who you are, okay? Uh, I'm just kind of learning your names, Michaela, Esperanza, Ryan, and Tess. Um, and I can see many of your faces, which I hope to get to know. Now, whoever you are, I'm going to treat you with the respect and the dignity that you deserve because you paid $550 to listen to me talk about seahorsey shaped clouds of hydrogen gas in space. And I thank you for your patronage, okay? This is a great deal for me. Um, now, my goal is to try to teach you stuff and maybe sort of entertain you. And I can only do that if you come to class with two things. The first and most important thing is a calculator. And I'm gonna tell you exactly which model I want you to buy. Um, the other is a positive attitude. And that's because all courses involve a little bit of hard work, right? And this course is no different than that. I'm gonna to try to make it fun and I'm gonna to try to do most of the work with you so it doesn't have to be stressful. But remember, you signed up for this. So if you're not having a good time, well, life sucks and then you die. There's nothing I can do about that. If you try to get into it and you try to enjoy, learn, luckily I'm not teaching you guys QuickBooks and accounting. If I did, I'd have probably slipped my wrists a long time ago. Thank God I get to talk to you about cool things like space and planets. That stuff sort of teaches itself, you know? Okay, so try to have fun, try to get into it, and that'll make the day go by a little better for all of us. Um, we're gonna learn about the solar system, and I'd like to suggest to you that the solar system is a pretty cool place to hang out, okay? You got Earth, that's where you live, and you know, one of the things you're gonna learn during the course of these lectures is that Earth is actually a pretty awesome planet. It's better than the other planets for a whole bunch of reasons. It's got unique geological processes. It has a magical atmosphere. There's a bunch of cool things going on on Earth. Um, we're going to study the moon because we all love the moon and can see it with our eyes. And uh, the moon is like our, our sister companion that's been beat to hell by meteorite impacts. And we're going to learn all about that. We'll learn the phases of the moon and eclipses, all kinds of things. We're going to study the sun because the sun is a vital and dynamic part of our solar system. It emits charged particles that make the atmospheres of planets glow. It gives us radiation and allows liquid water to exist on Earth. Um, and we'll study the eight planets, no longer featuring Pluto. Hey guys, what happened to Pluto? Why isn't Pluto a planet anymore? Y'all know about that? Pluto used to be a planet and now it's not a planet. Why? Ryan, do you know? Because the aliens stole it. <laughs> No, the aliens didn't steal it, although that would be kind of cool too. Um, maybe the aliens didn't steal it. Maybe they placed it there. Your paranoia isn't strong enough, okay? <laughs> All right, so, but why, why, did, why did we go from having nine planets to eight planets? Someone's got to know something about that. Because they voted to not have yeah. it as a planet? But why did they wake up one day, those mean astronomers, and say, I don't want Pluto to be a planet anymore? Look, when your mom and pa took, took the solar system course years ago, the solar system was like this. It was the sun, and it was the nine planets, and Pluto was the last planet. And then it was just supposed to be the empty void of space until you get to the next star, Alpha Centauri. And people just thought that's how it was. But, you know, planets don't shine because of their own light. They shine from reflected light. And if your planet is very small, and if it's very far away, like Pluto is, it only shines with just a little tiny speck of reflected light, meaning it's hard to see even with big telescopes. Well, at some point in the 1980s and 1970s, we started building really big telescopes that could see very faint specks of light. And we started discovering that there were other things like Pluto out there near Pluto that were not Pluto. They included objects like Sedna and Quayawar, and who could forget 2003 EL61? Actually, today this has been renamed. I think this is called Hyumea. It's egg-shaped. But all these little things, we call them Kuiper Belt objects, 
Oh, wow. Kuiper belt objects. These Kuiper belt objects are icy balls of dust and rock that look like Pluto. And if we found, oh, by the way, we started finding one, two, three, four, five. Finally, one day we found one that was actually bigger than Pluto. At first, they called it 2003 UB313. And then the astronomer that discovered it tried to name it Xena because he liked the TV show Xena Warrior Princess. And the International Astronomical Union said, no way are we going to let you do that. Uh, so today it's been renamed as Eris. But Eris posed a problem to us, right? Can I write Eris with this marker? Eris posed a problem, which is, once you get something that's bigger than Pluto, are you going to make that guy a planet? What about all these other guys? Should they be planets? Of course, we only found about 10 or 11 at first, but a quick calculation suggested that if we had found about 10 or 12 of these things, that there could be something like 100,000 or more of these Kuiper belt objects. Holy cow, are we going to make all of those planets planets too? It was time for a reevaluation. We said, you know what, Pluto, we used to think you were special. We used to think you were unique. But now we realize there's a lot of Pluto-like objects out there. And you're still cool enough. We'll call you a dwarf planet. But you're not going to get full bloody planet status anymore, OK? And there are other dwarf planets as well. Um, Many of these guys you see are now given dwarf planet designation, as well as there's a giant asteroid in the asteroid belt called Ceres, and that is also uh, a dwarf planet now. So Pluto's still there. It's still cool. We'll still talk about it, but it's not a planet anymore. These are the kind of things we're going to learn about in our class, okay? Now, you guys are about to make a new best friend. You didn't know this, but your new best friend is called math. And that's because astronomy is a physical science. Ain't no pseudoscience. This is the real damn science thing. And what makes science different than other enterprises, my friends, is that science is involved uh, with the art of measurement, OK? That's what science really is. It's a collection of measurements that you share with your friends. And anytime you measure something, like you measure the size of a thing or the mass of a thing, you get a bunch of numbers, and then you get a hankering to do math. Now, the reason why we do math is not because we want to torture children. It's because we want to discover the secrets of the solar system. If you like the moon, you think, wow, the moon looks so cool. I like it when it shines at night, and I like looking at it out my window. Well, if you want to understand what's going on here and why there are these grace blotches, you're going to need to develop an appetite for some sort of boring things. You're going to need to learn to look at some diagrams and some formulas with me so that I might reveal the secrets of the universe. If you want to know what's going on with this, what is this planet here? Who knows what this is? You guys are scaring the willies out of me. Does not one soul know what this planet is? The Jupiter? Yes. You can tell so by its iconic great red spot. Now, I can tell you some cool facts about Jupiter. I can tell you that the Great Red Spot is a storm hurricane system that's two Earths in diameter. But I can only tell you that because I like math and I like to look at pictures like this, OK? And so if you want to know the secrets of the universe along with me, you guys are going to need one of these. Why don't you write this down on your notebooks there? It's the Casio FX260 solar calculator. And I was telling a few of you about it before class started. This calculator is pretty damn good because it's cheap. It only costs eight bucks. Um, it's solar powered, which I think is kind of symbolic for an astronomy course. But that's also good because the batteries will never die during a test or anything. Uh, but most importantly, it has all of the buttons that we are going to want to use every day in a sort of convenient and easy to locate spot. I'll be teaching you about this button today. That's the EXP key, probably the most important key on the whole damn thing. That key is located conveniently. Now, I'm going to assume that you guys don't know anything, which based on the conversation so far seems to be a pretty good assumption, okay? But 
Um, I'm going to teach you what to do. You don't have to know complex calculus to do this course, okay? I'm going to assume that you're a reasonable person with a good attitude about life who can multiply and divide. Or let's say you're a person with a good attitude who can't multiply and divide. I'm going to assume that you're a person who could find the multiply and the divide keys on your calculator and punch them when I say go. And I'm just going to tell you what buttons to push, and that's how you're going to learn math. But this isn't going to work so well if all of us have different calculators. Now, just by a little show of hands, how many of you did fish up a scientific calculator so I can try to teach you some stuff today? Let me see some hands there. Put your hands in the air. Oh, you got one. Tess, that's an okay. What's the question? The question is how many of you have a calculator with you today, a scientific calculator? Like one I have your my phone. Yeah, you can use your phone. I think if you have an iPhone, the I you can upgrade your calculator to a scientific calculator. I use I like PCalc Lite. That's 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 the one I use. I use P can I focus that? PCalc Lite. Um it just looks kind of clean and nice. It's free, I think, or maybe I paid a buck for it or something. Uh and I think if you turn it sideways you get scientific features. I just think Pika, now look, I don't want you using this all semester because phones are terrible. They're not the same as having a real ass calculator. And like I said, I'm trying to keep it easy for you guys. I'm telling you, don't buy the lab book. I'll hook you up. I'm telling you, maybe don't even buy the textbook. I'll try to hook you up there. But this is eight bucks, okay? You can do that for me. Get this calculator. Are we all on board? We're gonna get this by Wednesday. You're gonna go to Staples, you're gonna buy this. Okay, that's the only thing I'm asking of you besides a little bit of homework, okay? All right. In the meantime, download PCalc Lite or use your iPhone calculator today because I wanna start training you. Um, before we go forward and start learning about astronomy, before we talk about the solar system, maybe we should talk about the classroom system. That way you guys know what I expect from you and, uh, you know, we can learn about how your grade is determined, which of course is very important to many of you. Okay, so a couple of you were asking me questions about attendance. The first thing you will discover in this class is that attendance is worth 0% of your grade. And that's because you paid $500 to listen to me talk about icy Pluto objects at the edge of our solar system. And I appreciate the patronage. I'll be here every Monday and Wednesday, and I'll be yapping about space and showing you cool pictures and trying to entertain you. If you'd like to join me, well, that's a great idea. That's a good idea for you, okay? Then you will get your money's worth. If you wanna go smoke bongs and play video games during class because you're incredibly busy, that's cool too, because you paid me. I don't care, all right? However, at some point, I'm going to have to grade you at the end of the semester. That's the tricky part, right? So if you want to learn some stuff and not fail, you probably should try to log in and be here. I know it's a really long class. I'll give you guys a tea break at some point, okay? Um, so you don't earn points through attendance. You just get entertainment, okay? Infotainment. Um, however, this is a four-credit lab science course. And that means we'll be doing a <clears throat> lab at the end of every lab session here. Now, normally lab is supposed to be hands-on and we're supposed to get together in a room where you can share germs and touch things where you can share germs and cough in each other's faces. We can't do that kind of stuff anymore, okay? The party's over. So now I've got to figure out how to do lab over the bloody internet. And um, I kind of figured this out last semester that I can sort of send I can send the Zoom camera to my iPhone, and you guys will notice that I brought my cart and all my toys from CCRI home with me in my apartment. And so the way we're gonna do lab is a little cheesy, but I'm basically gonna be your hands, I'm gonna be your avatar, and I'm gonna move the equipment around, and I'll hold my phone up so you can take the measurements, and somehow, that's how we're gonna do the lab, okay? Yeah, it's not perfect. It'd be cooler if you guys were playing with the stuff, but it works, it's fine, it gets the job done, and sometimes it's even interesting, okay? So, um, as you know, let me share the screen with you here. Uh, wait a minute, am I share, share screen? 
and let me go to the CSRI Blackboard page. Today's lab, if you click on the lab tab, is lab one powers of 10. And you can click on this PDF, and those are the three pages you're going to need to do today's lab. Today's lab is an introduction to measurement, powers of 10, and how to do scientific notation. That's a skill you're gonna need in my class. And I'm gonna walk you through that. Um, so like I said, if you can print that out, actually, how many people have access to a printer? I need to kind of figure these things out here on day one. Some, but not all. If you do not have access to a printer, here's what you're gonna to have to do. One option is you download the PDF and you mark it up with text, and then you'll be able to submit that. If you're really hard up and you're both not having a printer and your computer illiterate, then you're gonna actually have to write down the problems onto a piece of paper and then write the answers down. And at the end, usually what the students did last semester is you take your cell phone, you take a picture of the work and you submit that to Blackboard. Does that make sense? Do you guys know how to do that? Okay. Keep in mind guys, I don't know any of you. I don't know yet what you're capable of. And I don't, you guys may have been doing this kind of stuff all along. I don't really know. So I'm trying to figure that out. Okay, so let's talk about the setup here. Guys, can we go to the class handouts for a moment? Um, you should have uh, been able to download the syllabus. The course syllabus, I think my batteries are dying. Uh, before you move on, I have a question. So the when you go on lab. Yes. And it says lab one. So that's the, the one that we have to complete today. So we have to like basically send you a picture of it or like send it by email. Yeah, that one. Yeah, but uh, is this uh, Janita speaking? Yeah, Janita. Janita. Um, I'm not going to leave you to do this on your own. Unlike other courses where you have a lot of assignments that you have to struggle in the dark, I'm pretty much volunteering myself to do everything with you so we won't be confused. So when lab time comes, if you have this paper, I'm gonna do the problems with you and you'll just kind of follow along with me. That way it's not too confusing. And then yes, at the end, you'll take a picture and submit it. Does that help? Yeah, it helps. At the end of the day, right? It doesn't matter what time. Yeah, but I'm, my hope is that since we'll all be doing this together, at the end of class, you should be, at the end of lab, you should be done. And then you can just take five minutes after class to upload it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Basically, here's the trade-off. If you had to do this on your own, class would end and then you'd be like struggling on your own and it would be boring and you'd be getting distracted by food and video games or whatever. But now, because we're all gonna just suffer through it and do it together, you'll know exactly what to write down, you'll know what the answers are, and that way when you submit it, you get a full 10 points. That will keep everyone's grade up. I'm sure everyone will appreciate that. Ooh, Tess, we like that doggy. What's your, what's your pooch name? His name is Tuck. Hey, Tuck. Hi. I can see that Tuck is going to be a valuable member of this class. We're going to be calling on him sounds, to answer many questions. Sounds good. <laughs> go, go lay down. Um, in my last semester, all my Astronomy 1010 students had cats, <laughs> and all my Astronomy 1020 students had dogs. So there was cat crew and there was dog crew, and it really helped the day go by. <clears throat> um, uh oh. Uh, anyways, so. Michaela, I'm going to walk you through how this lab is going to work. So just bear with me, okay? In any case, you've got two things to do for me in this class besides taking tests. You've got to do homeworks and you've got to do labs. And we're pretty much going to do one homework in one lab every class because every class is supposed to be a complete chapter. It's the equivalent of a week during our normal assignments. So you, uh, you upload them right to Blackboard. Like when you click on this lab, this is just in case people are still not familiar with how this works. Uh, bear with my internet here, it's senile. When you click on the lab, there's a place here to su uh, submit your assignment. Oh, by the way, can you all do me a favor? Many of you will just be taking pictures with your cell phone. And if some of you have newer iPhones, it stores them in a high resolution format called HEIC. I can't freaking read that. I can read JPEGs, PDFs, 
and maybe Word documents. So you might want to go to your iPhone and change your photo settings to most compatible from high resolution. I'll be able to walk you through that at the end of lab today, but remind me to have that talk with you. Because if I can't see your assignments, I can't grade them. So we're going to be talking about that. Okay, so let's get back to how we earn some points in this class. If you guys go to the syllabus, you can see a breakdown of your grade schematic. So first of all, let me just walk you through this here. Here's our class. This is me. Here's my email. I even put my bloody cell phone on here. Um, because I don't go to the office anymore, I can't answer my office phone. If you guys are cool and respectful about it, you can text me, you can call me. I don't care. Um, you know, if you call me late at night, I might be buzzed. And so that's your problem, not mine. Okay. So, but in any case, uh, um, I'll try to answer you. I want to be like a modern 24 seven kind of person here. So I'll try to answer you whenever you need it. Um, my office is zoom. If you want to have a private appointment with me, we can set that up, but I'm hoping that most of it will be self-contained. Um, our lecture times are slightly different than how it builds in the class, but it's the same total length of time. We meet every Monday and Wednesday from 12 p.m. to almost 3 p.m. Now, it said 2.30 in the class listing. That's because they were going to give us two hours for lab. I'd like to have a little more time for lecture and a little less time for lab. So lecture will go to three, uh, but lab will only be an hour and a half. And by the way, I'll probably actually try to get our labs done in like an hour. And that means we should be done by four o'clock. But that's still a long day, so hang on to your seats. Because three hours is a long ass time to listen to anyone talk, I'm gonna try to have a tea break around 1.30. So uh, if I forget about it because I'm talking, remind me that it's getting close to tea break and we'll just take a little 15 minute pause to drink some iced tea and just to, well, just to stop for a second. That's good for people. Um, I don't know if there's any questions about that yet. Now, in the breakdown of your grade, here's how your grade is determined in this class. It's an even distribution. It's a four credit course, and I think 25% of your grade should be based on homework. 25% of your grade is the midterm. 25% is lab grade, and 25% is final grade. And then I apply a sort of curve uh, at the end that I'll tell you about at a later time. Before, what, let's not worry about the tests just yet. For now, what we're going to be focusing on are the homeworks and the labs. Now, labs are pretty easy. We're just going to kind of do it together, and you sort of write down the answers, and then you submit it, and that's 10 points for you. Uh, it shouldn't be too hard. I'm also going to be recording these lectures. So in the event that you get eaten, partially eaten by an alligator and you have to miss class for some reason, you should be able to watch it later on YouTube. But be really careful about this, guys, because we're going to be moving so fast that if you, if you miss a class and you miss a lab, you're going to have to make it up either that night or the next day before the class kind of rolls away with you. So be I think the smart thing to do is just to kind of be here Mondays and Wednesdays and we just do it all live. Also, I should just say on a philosophical note, I'm not used to the online class thing. So I'm treating this online class just like if we were live in a classroom together. I show up at the class time at 12 o'clock. I do my song and dance. I help you through homeworks. I help you through labs. We submit our stuff and then we can go home. I'm trying to make it so that you don't have long assignments to do at night by yourself. And I think you guys can all appreciate that, right? Wouldn't it be nice to just be done by 4.30 and not have to worry about this until the next day? I'm gonna do it all with you. Okay, so lab is a quarter of your grade. It's an important part of your grade, but the nice thing is that lab is really easy. The part of this class that is not so easy, believe it or not, is the homework. Every class, you have what's called a problem set due. That is five problems from the back of the textbook, some of which are mathematical and some of which are kind of hard. Um, in a classic astronomy or physics course, these problem sets would be done by you, the student, on your own time. They would be brutal and torturous. You'd spend hours on them and you'd still screw them up and you'd honestly have nightmares and anxieties over this. But at some point I realized that it's not really the student's fault if these problems are too hard for them. It's because many of you have not done a physical science course like this. 
And I realized a much better way for us to do it was for us to just do all the homework together, kind of like we do in lab. Now, yes, that's going to add some extra hours to this course. But the trade-off is you don't have to do it at home by yourself. Remember that there is no class you could take that does not have assignments and homework. I am just offering my free time to do the homework with you. So let me explain a little bit about how this works. Uh, let me go back to our syllabus here. And can I get you guys to take a peek? Where did my task bar go? This is the thing that's really freaking me out. Oh, here it is. Okay, I want you guys to look at the back side of our syllabus. This is the schedule. This is the most important piece of paper that you get from me all semester because it has our entire summer session gridded out. Um, we've got the date, Monday, May 18th. Our lecture is on the nighttime sky and an introduction to the course. I'll be covering chapter two in the textbook. Our lab is measurements and power of 10. And our homework assignment, which is hypothetically due at the beginning of next class, that's when we, okay, that's, I'm used to still seeing you guys once, uh, once a class period and you'd normally turn in physical papers to me. Things are different now. So let's just say we'll try to turn the homework in at the end of the day that we do it on. And that should be fine because we're gonna do it together. Now, <clears throat> the problems that you have to do are five problems from the textbook. Uh, questions 44, 48, 53, 57, and 59. I actually provided those for you in the Blackboard. If you go here to your homework tab, forgive me if this is all obvious to you guys, but I'm assuming it's not. See how it says homework one, five problems? I actually provided you guys a scan of the five problems. So you didn't even need to buy the book today. See that? Now our first problem is 44. A new planet. A planet in a solar system has circular orbit and an axis tilt of 35 degrees. Would this planet have seasons? Would they be more and more extreme than the seasons on Earth? If not, why not? I'm not assuming that you guys intrinsically know the answer to that question. That's something you're gonna have to get from my lecture today. This question will be answered in paragraph form. So we'll write maybe one or two paragraphs to answer it. Some of the questions are going to be math questions. One of our questions today uh, is going to be like this guy here. Use the sun's distance of 150 million kilometers and its angular size 0.5 degrees to calculate the physical diameter. Now let's face it, that's something that most of you do not know how to do. Yes, I will teach you how to do this during the course of my class, but that doesn't mean you're still gonna be able to do it on your own. For this reason, I've decided that this whole game works a lot better if I do your homework for you and you just watch me do it. So we're gonna kind of do our homeworks together. And that's where we have our legendary office hour sessions. Unfortunately, because this is a summer course and we got a lot to do, the time that it makes the most sense to have office hours are before class starts from 10 to 12. I am not a morning person. I'm gonna hate waking up to do this. But honestly, I'd rather do your homework with you than look at the kind of crap that you're gonna turn into me. Or more likely than not, the crap that you just will blow off and not do and get zeros for. So I've tried letting you do the homework on your own. It does not work. Now, anyone who doesn't wanna do this, you are free to try these problems on your own. But since we meet every other day, you're gonna to have to like work on them that night. And trust me, on your own, it's gonna be a lot harder and a lot more miserable and it's gonna take you longer. If you do the homework with me, you will get it done faster, cheaper, and better. Um, probably what we'll do is normally, I'll wake up late and we'll start at 10.30, but there are a couple of homeworks that take the full two hours, so we'll have to start at 10, and I'm gonna be really grumpy on those days. But here's the thing, I'm, we're all gonna do the homework together It'll be a communal experience and then it will be like less horrible. Most importantly, you're gonna learn exactly what I want from you. You guys will read the questions to me. I'll sort of set up the answers on the board. You kind of copy them down and you learn by imitation and that's what you'll submit to me and I'll give you a perfect score, 25 out of 25. Does that sound good to people? You like that? All right, I wanna be clear so about- are you this. Say, oh, Sorry. Oh. Are you saying that we're, we'll do the homework during the 10 to 12 before class? 
That's right. And, and Tess, I want to be clear about this because sometimes people get confused about what's going on. Sometimes people say things like, you want me to come for extra time? You want me to come early and I have to spend more hours? Nah, brah, not at all. Go ahead and do that homework on your own if you like. Give that a shot. Tonight, if you think you're up for it, do the homework and we'll see how you do. But let's say you don't want to do that. Let's say you find that that's hard. Then you come for office hours before class starts, before your homework is due, and we'll do it together. So in a way, I'm vol Look, guys, here's the deal. If you turn in crappy, shitty homeworks, it takes a long time for me to grade them, and I end up getting pissed off. I sit there biting my nails, and I'm angry at the world, and I curse your name to the sun, okay? And then I give you a shitty grade, and everyone's kind of miserable. At some point, I outfoxed the game. I realized if I just show them what I want, then they'll learn how to do it right, and I can spend hardly any time grading it because I have a perfect homework. It's kind of like everybody wins. I just traded the time that I would have spent miserably grading crappy homeworks, and I traded that time to just hang out with you and talk to you and show you how to do it right. That seems like better to me. And it's certainly better for you because you will not be able to do this homework on your own in an hour or less unless you have extreme physics training, which I don't think anyone here has. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. Do you understand the logic? It's, it's not really extra time. It's just the time that you would have spent doing your homework. We're going to do it together. Is anyone going to have a problem making those office hour sessions? Because it's kind of essential for doing well in this course. Total crickets. That's what I was expecting. Okay, look, here's what's going to happen. From now on, you will be logging into the Zoom at 10 or 10.30. Does that make sense? That makes you will sense. Do okay, good. You will do this. You are no longer in control of your life. You will do everything <laughs> I say you, exactly as I would say. You be, <laughs> would you be the one that's sending the links in the morning? Or we just have to like get in um, on the link you send? So I think there's a way to set up a permanent link, but I'm lazy and I haven't figured that out <laughs> yet. So my method now is like, like 15 minutes before I'm on, I send you the link. Kind of like I did it today and most of you figured that out. So does that work for you guys if I just email you the link and then you log yeah. in? All right. Now listen, if you show up late to this thing, I have just enough time to cover all five problems. So if you log in at like 11, you're going to miss the first two problems and then you'll probably get a 15 out of 25 instead of a 25 out of 25. Yes, I'm going to record them. So if something really crazy comes up, like you got to take your Grammy to the emergency room or something, you could probably watch it later, but that just means you're trading off doing it before class for doing it at night when you're tired and sleepy and grumpier. So I think our goal should be to just try to suck it up and do all our work together before class starts. You guys understand the logic of what I'm saying here? Yes. All right. Okay. I just want to be clear about that. I'm not asking you to do extra. I'm asking you to do the work and I'm volunteering my time to do it with you. It's a good damn deal. So tomorrow I will send the link around 10 AM. We will all log in. We will do our homework. Then we have lecture, then we have lab. That's going to be our course every Wednesday and every Monday and Wednesday. It's pretty much the whole effing day. Now, I don't like it either, but, but I, need to, I need to get paid. That's why I do this. Also, I kind of like space. That helps. Okay. Now, you guys need your grades, and you need to pass college for whatever damn reason you've chosen. So that's why you need to do it. So we all are motivated to do our work, correct? Yep. What I don't want to see is people blowing this shit off and me having to give you a bunch of zeros because that's going to be hard for you. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, this course has a rhythm. You got to trust me. I'm on your side. Just do what I tell you to do and it's going to be fun and you're not going to be stressed out. I promise. Okay. After that, there's only two other ways to score points in this class. There's going to be a big scary midterm. It's going to be evil. It's going to be like 100 questions, and it's going to take you at least two hours to do, and it's going to scare the holy bejesus out of you. Now, sometimes in summer class, if I like students, I only make them do the midterm 
And then I use their midterm grade in place of a final. And so sometimes I'll make a deal with students where I trade them. Do you want the last class to be a final exam? Or do you want the last class to be a lecture where I teach you more cool stuff about space? People almost always choose the lecture over the final exam because it's less stressful. Um, but that means all the pressure is going to be on the midterm. Now, here's the deal. If you've been following along with me and you've just been showing up to the office hours and showing up to the lab, you will have learned enough that you can kind of machete hack your way through the midterm, even if you don't like studying very much. So just do whatever the hell I tell you to do, and it will be the least amount of work and the most amount of fun, okay? Thank God I don't teach art. I don't have to look at your crappy little sculpture at the end of the semester and say, B minus, I'm not making this shit up. Your grade is a number, and you've got to move around the Monopoly board and put the points into the slots. You can only do that if you're there for office hours and you're there for lab. Okay, does anyone have any questions about how their grade will be determined? Or did that kind of explain things? Um, so tomorrow we'll have a class? Uh, did I say tomorrow? I meant to say Wednesday. Oh, OK, because you, you scared the crap out of me. I'm sorry. I say dumb things like that all the time. Uh, we meet on Mondays and Wednesdays. So today we're going to be doing lecture and lab. But starting on Wednesday, we're going to do all three whoppers, homework session, lecture lab yes that's intense but all the work will be done and when you switch off your computer you don't have to think about astronomy until the next day i'll never make you write a term paper i'll never make you travel to your local observatory you'll just be done okay and it will be done correctly okay look it's customary for every professor to try to explain to the students before class how their grade's going to be determined and what I expect of you. I hope that I made that clear. But like I said, this is the first time I've ever done a class entirely online. So there may be things that I'm not thinking about. Just basically log in when I tell you to log in and log off when I tell you to log off and the rest of it will just be autopilot. That's pretty much the moral of the story. Okay. Congratulations, you just had lecture zero. That was your introduction to astronomy 1010. And uh, we've been following along with this. Uh, let's check out your Roman numeral notes for a second here. If I go over to Blackboard, do you guys see this section with lecture notes? Every class, I'm sort of following along from some crappy little lecture notes that just sort of an outline of what I intend to do that day. You guys just had lecture zero, an introduction to 1010. Um, and here you can see uh, we covered astronomy and astrology. We talked about the solar system. And we basically covered how your grade is determined. And so now I'm going to move on to actually talking about astronomy. We'll move on to lecture one. Now, these notes aren't really all comprehensive. But one of the nice things is that they have um, certain conversion factors and other things that we're going to need in boxes. So that might be helpful to you if you want to kind of follow along. OK, let's begin. Uh, I want to start by showing you guys a constellation. Uh, let me see. I have two different lectures here. Let's start with this one. OK, function f5. Do you know what this is? You're looking at a famous constellation. Isn't that Orion's belt? Not only Orion's belts. Wait, who said that? I'm learning who people. Me. Oh, wait, who's, oh, Brandon. Yes, okay, sorry. I had to scroll through all the little faces here. Um, yes, Brandon, it's not just Orion. Hold on, let me help with annotation here. It's not just Orion's belt. It's the whole damn constellation of Orion. Orion is a wintertime hunter constellation. Um, he has, let me see here. He has a couple of shoulder blades. This is his left shoulder. That's the famous red star Betelgeuse. Um, he's got a right shoulder. His shoulders come down to his belt, and then his belt extends to his legs. This star here is the famous blue star Rigel three stars that make up his belt. These three stars, one, two, three, are called the Sword of Orion. 
and the middle star is actually a nebula. It's not a star at all. He's kind of missing a head, but he sometimes is depicted holding a bow or holding a cat, and he's got a club that's further up here, but that kind of got cropped off. Now, you cannot see Orion every single night. Orion is up during the day in the summertime. You can only see Orion maybe, oh, hello, Janita, I can finally see your face. Yay. Okay. Um, you can only see Orion maybe um, in the late autumn and winter time. My goal during the course of these first couple lectures is going to be to teach you how the nighttime sky rotates. It's actually kind of complicated. I also want to teach you how to talk smart about things on the sky. How do we talk about stars? How do we talk about these blinky lights in the sky? There's kind of like a whole bunch of fancy vocabulary terms we need to discuss together. So uh, I'll be giving you notes as we go, and I strongly suggest you write that stuff down, especially because many of you may not get a textbook right away, and so these notes are going to be what you have to study from. Um, before we get started, it might be nice to kind of give you a little tour of where you are in the universe. And um, <clears throat> this is called the Pioneer Plaque. It's a I think it was a brass plaque that was attached to the Pioneer spacecraft, one of the first man-made spacecraft to leave the solar system. And we wanted to put a little record on it in case aliens ever found the spacecraft, we'd have a little message of where it came from. And you can see a naked man and woman in relationship to the antenna of the spacecraft. They've mapped the whole thing out in terms of a hydrogen atom. And they show the spacecraft coming from the third rock from the sun. And they show the location of the sun relative to a bunch of pulsars. This is basically a roadmap of how to come and find us and eat us or conquer us so aliens will know what to do. Um, now, who knows? Probably nothing will ever find this thing. But it gets me thinking that you guys might want to know some things. Like, does anyone know the difference between the solar system and, and a galaxy? Or What's the solar system? I just want to figure out what the hell you guys know so I know how to dial my lectures up, you know? Ian, do you know what a solar system is? Isn't a solar system a collection of planets? Okay, and a star. And a star, yeah. Okay, so let's take a look then. Uh, slides. Oops, well, there's Earth. That's where you live. And Earth is one of eight planets in the solar system. So here's a little overview of our solar system. There's the sun. We've got the eight planets of our solar system. Now, back in the day, we used to remember the names of the planets with a mnemonic device that went like this. My very educated mother just served us nine pizzas. And then we got rid of Pluto as a planet. So now it's my very educated mother just served us nothing, which is funny in its own right. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of dwarf planets or minor planets Ceres, Pluto, and Eris, as well as a couple of other Kuiper Belt objects. The solar system also includes magnetic fields and little bits of gas and dust that are scattered around, but that's pretty much it. Uh, so when you said a bunch of planets, that's not wrong. Just don't forget the sun is a big part of that too. And dwarf planets. Oh, the asteroid belt and comets are also a part of our solar system. I'll talk about those in good time. What if I leave the solar system? What if I got in the spacecraft and just flew outside of it like the Pioneer spacecraft did, where would I be then? What's outside of the solar system? When, would that be the galaxy? Yeah. So if you could like zoom out, you would be inside the Milky Way galaxy. Now, I'm not showing you an actual picture of the Milky Way galaxy. I'm showing you an artist illustration of the Milky Way galaxy. And a galaxy is like a swirling disk of stars and their planets, but also galaxies contain tremendous quantities of gas. I can show you our sister galaxy, which looks quite, oops, sorry, let me share that screen again. Our sister galaxy we think looks somewhat similar to our galaxy. Let me show you the Andromeda galaxy. I mean, this is an astronomy course. The whole reason we paid all this money is so that we could look at badass pictures in space together and learn about what they mean. Um, our Milky Way probably resembles this. 
you can't actually make out individual stars. The, the stars that you do see are probably in the foreground of our own galaxy. But this is a giant swirl of gas and starlight called the Milky Way. Does anyone know why I can show you a picture, a real picture of the Andromeda galaxy, but I can only show you an illustration of the Milky Way? Because we don't have the technology to fly past the Milky Way and take a picture? Uh, or, or fly outside yeah. of it, right? Right, Brandon? Because you're stuck inside of this thing. You're like a little... Um, um, <clears throat> ladybug sitting on a leaf inside of a forest. And a ladybug who's sitting on a leaf in a forest cannot see the whole forest at once. Now, in theory, a ladybug might be able to fly out of the forest and look back at the thing and say, oh, that's home. But we don't have enough time in our lifetimes or even in the age of the unit, well, maybe not the age of the universe, maybe the age of our solar system. It would take a long ass time to fly outside of this thing and look back at it from a sufficient distance to see it. So the, the Milky Way galaxy is too big. We have to kind of try to understand what our galaxy looks like by looking at other galaxies. It's kind of annoying. The one galaxy we sometimes know the least about is our own galaxy, or at least we don't have a good picture of it. That's only partially true, but for now, let's pretend it's true. Okay, there's a lot of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's time for you guys to have a lesson. You ready to do some work? Come up to my board here. Uh, figuring out how to move this thing so that you can see the whole board is kind of, it's an art form in itself. Yeah, uh, you need to, I think one of the reasons why I gotta be back a little bit is so that you guys can see the whole board, sorry. Okay. Time for a lesson. Wow. Class, uh, the red marker really stained the hell out of the board. It is dry erase. Hold on, guys. I want to keep it squeaky clean so that you guys can see what I'm writing carefully here. That was weird. I don't know what that was all about. Okay. All right, here we go. Um, our first lesson is about big numbers. I'm going to teach you about scientific Notation. That's our first lesson there. Uh, there we go. Let's start by considering the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. The number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy is one trillion stars. And I'd like you guys, and that's approximately. Can you guys write that down for me in your notebooks? I'm gonna try to write straight from now on. I'm, I'm crooked here. Does anyone know how big a trillion is? Like how many zeros are in a trillion? You're all babes in the woods. Suppose you win a, uh, Zach, uh, nine zeros is a billion. Take one more guess. 12. Yes, sir. Let's write that down together. A one followed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 stars. And I want you to just write that down with me. Now, you all don't have a Casio calculator, but I do. 
And I want to show you guys something here. If I clear this out, let me punch in some numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. And that's it. And that means there are 10 decimal places in a typical Casio FX260 solar calculator. That means this number is too big to put into your calculators. Not only is it too big to put into a calculator, but it's too big for you to write down on the piece of paper. I will get annoyed with you if you write down a number of this size. We are going to need a lesson on how to compact this number into a sort of a more uh, contracted form that's easy to work with. Now, how many of you have done scientific notation before? A show of hands will help me gauge how hardcore to go on this here. I'm seeing only three people. Michaela, you've never done scientific notation before? Oh, Esperanza? Michaela? Oh, Megan, kinda? A little bit? All right. Yeah, I'm not saying, are you good at scientific notation? I'm just asking, have you ever seen scientific notation? So some of you are vaguely acquainted with this. Okay, so watch my moves here. Um, I need to diagram this number out for you and explain a couple of different parts. This digit here is called the lead digit. The lead digit is the first number in your number. It's, it's one through nine. The lead digit cannot be zero ever, okay? So write that down. No zero. Yanita, are you reading this okay? okay. Um, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, cool. You fit, so you figured out whatever the hell was going on before? Uh, yeah. All right, guys, I'm assuming you can read all this stuff, so please talk to me. Okay, this part of the number here, this is the number of zeros. And the little tag at the end of your number, this is called your unit. Units are of extreme importance in science courses. Units help you think, and they make you a badass person who can work with complicated numbers and tricky problems. Believe it or not, units are at the heart of all science because they involve measurements, okay? Now, we're gonna make use of some powers of 10 to pack these numbers into a more percentage. Let me take you on a trip back through math memory for a second. Memory. Um, for instance, oh, I'm sorry, did someone have a comment or was that just background chatter? Okay, background chatter. Um, in your math class, in some ancient math class, you will have learned some things like this. 10 to the power of one means 10 sort of times one. And 10 to the power of two means 10 times 10, which is 100. And 10 to the power of three is 10 times 10 times 10, which is 1,000. And that means every time you raise 10 to another power, it's a one followed by that many zeros. For instance, 10 to the power of four is 10,000. 10 to the power of five is 100,000. Okay, now you guys try it. What's 10 to the power of zero equal to? Hey, someone in the background who's like opening the drawers and looking for chocolate milk or whatever you're doing. Oh, is that Yanita? Oh yeah, mute yourself. There you go. Um, can anyone tell me what 10 to the power of zero is? A 10? It's zero. Uh, pardon? It's right. zero. It is not zero. That's a tricky one. Um, 10 to the power of zero is actually the number one. And here's my logic. You can always multiply any number by one, right? If 10 to the power of two are two tens, and 10 to the power of one is one ten, if you take away the one ten and you have zero tens, a one is left behind. See, this is what's different. 
People think that zero is the default number, probably because zero is the default number in their bank account. But in mathematics, zero is not the default number, okay? One is the default number. In algebra, one is the natural number. Zero is actually kind of messed up. How can you have nothing? How can you count nothing? I don't know. In any case, a 10 to the power of zero removes this 10, but it leaves the one behind. Never forget that. That's a cool trick. By the way, any number uh, raised to the power of zero is always one for that logic, okay? Okay, how many zeros we got here, Zach? 12, he says. I, I saw you mouth it. 12. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, so watch my moves, how we're gonna do this and follow along with me. It's real simple. We write down our lead digit. So we write down one, and then we pack the zeros into 10 to the power of 12, and then we write our unit down. One times 10 to the 12 stars. That's how one writes a trillion in scientific notation. Now, I know what y'all thinking. Y'all thinking, hey man, that looks like a math problem. Wrong, this is not a math problem. This is a number, like the number 52. It just has a 10 and a 12 in it, but that shouldn't distract you, okay? Um, because this is such an important technique, we should all have a very powerful button on our calculator that lets us put numbers into scientific notation. <clears throat> on the Casio calculator, let me just get this in focus here. Come on. That's the EXP key located right underneath the three. The EXP key is going to help us put numbers into scientific notation. And EXP is times 10. That's what it means, okay? So for instance, on a Casio calculator, we would simply type one EXP 12 if we wanted to put in a trillion, okay? You don't hit equals. I want you guys to watch me do it, okay? Um, I have an iPhone that I can share with. There's a better way to do this. Uh, several times during the course of this class, you're gonna need to see things from me. Uh, I can show you with my phone here. Hold on a second. I want to turn my Wi-Fi and leave it on for a sec. For now, because we're getting close to tea break here, watch me, let me get this in focus. Sorry, everything's kind of backwards, so it's weird. One EXP 12. Now, do you see how they've listed it up there as a one with a little 12 up at the top? That's calculator speak for one times 10 to the 12. You will never, ever, ever write this down. So notice I didn't hit equals there. So what you're gonna see on your calculator, the display is gonna look like this. The reason why they don't put the times 10 in there is because the calculator space is precious and they don't have enough room for the times 10. When you write it down, you must always put the times 10 back in. One times 10 to the 12. If you don't write it this way, I will actually deduct points from your homework until you learn. Do we understand? So you will never, ever, ever, never write that. You only look at that. <coughs> Okay, I'm gonna show you another example in just a moment. I hope you guys are kind of following me here. Can I erase or are we still copying? I will periodically ask, thanks for the thumbs up. Yeah, I'll periodically ask you if I can erase so I don't go too fast. Okay, let's say you had a more complicated number to work with, an annoying number. Let's say you had a number like nine, eight, 
7654-3210. Now this is an annoying number. It's a number that's too big for us to kind of look at on the calculator. Unlike the previous problem, not all of the digits are zero. Can you guys identify the lead digit for me? Nine. Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to recognize that the decimal point used to be here. And we're going to want to move it to just behind the lead digit. Sorry, my autofocus is kind of crappy here. So we're going to count how many times the decimal place moves. It moves 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Basically, we're going to treat all of these numbers as if they were zeros, all the numbers that aren't the lead digit. So all those are, are zeros. So I'm going to write down 9. Now I'm going to keep the numbers afterwards like they were changed, like I was keeping the change in my bank account. 8764321. I don't need to write the zero. Times 10. And now I'm going to count how many times I moved. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Basically, I'm acting like all of the other digits were zero. Or in other words, the nine is how many times I had to move the decimal place. And this is how you write that number in scientific notation. Now, a reasonable person might say to me, hey man, the whole point of doing scientific notation was to take this ugly number and make it more compact and easy to read. But now the number is even longer than that one. It seems like you did worse. And technically you'd be correct. But the issue is normally in a science class, especially in astronomy class, we don't need to keep all of these digits. This part of the number here is what we call the precision. And I'm going to give you a big speech about precision during our lab today. This here, this part of the number is called the power of 10. Or sometimes people refer to it as, here's a fancy phrase, the order of magnitude. The order of magnitude of a number tells you the general size of your number. Are we talking of a number the size of thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions? That's the sort of thing that scientists sometimes want to know. What is the order of magnitude or the general size of a number? Is the Milky Way millions of times bigger than a star? Trillions of times bigger than a star? Talk to me here, okay? Now, oftentimes we don't need to keep all of these numbers, oftentimes what we can do is we can round the precision of the number. Now, I'm going to teach you guys about rounding during lab today in the official rules. But until you learn them, this is the sort of general rule of thumb. Keep two significant figures. Keep the first digit and the second digit. Now, if I want to chop and round my number there, the rule of thumb is if the first number that you're chopping is five or greater, you have to increment this number up. Otherwise, if this number is less than five, you leave that number flat. Seven is clearly greater than five, so I would simply round this number as 9.9 .9 times 10 to the nine. And now my number looks much better and much easier to work with. Now there's two issues going on here. One issue is the putting of numbers into scientific notation, which I'm hoping you have learned. The other issue is rounding, and we'll treat rounding at a later time. Does anyone know how to say this number in plain English? How would I say that number, like one human to another human? Would it be 9,900,000? Uh, 9 billion, 900 million, but Zach, 900 million. that's okay. But Zach, do you want to know a nice, even cleaner way to say it? You just say 9.9 .9 billion. Okay. 
yes, you could say 9 billion, 900 million, but that is, that's like too many words. I'm getting bored just listening to that, right? So 9.9 .9 billion is a little more to the point. Um, because of this, before we take a little pause, I wanna make a little chart for you guys of some common powers of 10 so that you and I can talk to each other, okay? So follow along with me here. We're gonna make a little chart of some powers of 10 together. So, um, I love making tables and graphs because I'm a science-y kind of guy. Having a ruler during the course of this class would be really helpful. If you don't have a ruler, use something straight. You can use the edge of a Dixon Ticonderoga box or, sorry, my focus is acting effed up here. There we go. Use the edge of a box or whatever. Okay, so. We're gonna make one, two, three columns. and maybe four or five rows. Okay, so this will be the name of my number. This will be the power of 10. And here we will have the metric prefix. This is just so that we have some common, common ways of talking to each other. So we learned that a trillion is 10 to the power of 12. Uh, how about a billion? Zach, you remember what a billion is now, right? Power of nine. Okay. Anyone know what a million is? Power of six. And of course, everyone should know what a thousand is. Power of three. Okay, do you guys know any of the metric prefixes for these? Because they will come up during the course of our class. How about a thousand? When something has three, like a thousand meters, we have a prefix for that, right? If you have a thousand grams of dank nugs, you have a, what do you got? No one knows the metric prefixes? Well, okay. A thousand is called a kilo. This is the new stuff for you guys, I guess. Anyone wanna try a million? Like a kilobyte is a thousand bytes, right? How about a million? What's after kilo? The mega? Yeah. That's right, a mega. That's a million. Giga? Giga? Terra. Yeah, all right. You guys know what comes after Terra, what 10 to the 15 is? It's a peta. There's, there's names for them all the way up and down. It's crazy. I'll be introducing you to some of them over the course of this class, but students, kilo, mega, giga, terra, thousand, million, billion, trillion, I want you to be familiar with the number of zeros in these. That's why I had you made this little thing here, okay? Okay, now, in our class, we have a rule. Write this down. This is a class rule. Any number which is greater than 1 million, 10 to the 6, must 
be in scientific notation. All right, that's our class rule. I don't mind if you write down 999,999, but as soon as it flips up to 1 million, I wanna see one times 10 to the six. I don't have time to count all the zeros on your homework. It's too irritating. So this is a really important class rule. That's why we learned it. Now, to help you learn how to become masters of scientific notation, I will dedicate our lab today. It's a short but quick lab where we're all gonna try doing calculations together. That's why I need you to have a crappy little calculator nearby. Okay, class, um, it's now 1.40. These lectures are long as hell, like almost three hours. And I know it's hard to listen to anyone talk for that length of time. It's an almost impossible task. Normally when I have like a live in-person class, to help with listener fatigue, I have, and to help me get a drink, I've instituted tea break as a sacred time. And tea break is kind of like, like a little 15 minute window where I just stop talking. Usually I would go down to my office and I would make tea and drink tea. And then after that we would continue. I think we should keep alive the tradition of tea break because it gives you guys a chance to do the hurly gurly. You can ask yourself, questions or talk to each other or me. I'm still going to float around. I just might go to the kitchen and get some iced tea and relax a little bit. And then, uh, and then we will start. Uh, we'll, we'll continue our lecture at, say, 2 o'clock, which is a little over 15 minutes from now. Does everyone like the idea of tea break? Does that sound good to people? Nick likes it, and so does Brandon. So if, all right, everyone's down with that. So I'm going to keep the recording going. I'm going to keep I'm going to be logged in. You might even hear me fumbling with glasses. And sometimes I come back over to talk to you, whatever. But let's just take a little pause before we go forward. I think that'll be good. Any questions before I get iced tea? Or, okay. Actually, I changed my mind. I'm going to pause the recording. Zoom recording. Okay. So tell us your dog's name again. Her name is Macy. Macy sure is a cutie, huh? Yeah, I know. Is Macy enjoying the astronomy lecture? Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you get a question right, you should give Macy a little snack, a little treat. And she's then we'll see if we can train her to get really excited every time. Eating, you know. um, veggie straws right now. Oh. <laughs> Probably not good, but well. No way. When, when I was a kid, our dogs just ate whatever was on the table that we didn't eat. We just went, pushed it right on the floor. They were the garbage disposal. It was great. <laughs> Nowadays, my brother won't give his dog a piece of chicken, but oh, he might choke on that chicken bone or no, Brenna, we can't let him off the leash. He might get this weird Japanese fungus. And I'm like, Ben, what are you talking about? We just used to do whatever we wanted with our dogs. It was so much fun. Now, now it's different. We got to be careful with the little pooches. Yeah. So. Uh-oh, Brandon, who's this guy? Now, here's another one. Oh, this is <laughs> dog crew. I totally got dog crew this time. That's a handsome dog, Brandon. Who is that? <clears throat> That's Stewie. He's a Australian Shepherd. Oh man, what a beautiful pooch, huh? I love dogs. I'm not gonna lie, I grew up with dogs all my life. I love them. That is a great looking mutt. <laughs> yeah, he's a 
I got to keep him upstairs, though, because he goes crazy down here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I understand. I know the drill. Yeah. Wow. Stewie is awesome. So Stewie and Macy, and who else had a dog? With Tess, was that you that had a dog earlier? Or, or No, wait, that was you just had one now. I had my dog earlier. My dog's over here. <laughs> oh, you got one too, Zach? Yeah. This is awesome. Switch. Hey. <laughs> What's that guy's name? Uh, it's Dottie. Dottie. Nice. That's a girl. <laughs> wow. So everyone's got dogs. Now, I don't have a, I live in a kind of a small loft, so I don't have a dog no more, but I do have a pet raccoon who lives in the drain outside my place. And at some point, I'll show you guys some videos of my pet raccoon. He's pretty funny. Um, his name is Buff. And he lives in a little sewer next to my house. And so every day I feed him some scraps and I make a, little Instagram video. I've never been so popular in all my life, let me tell you. <laughs> we, have, we have a raccoon too that we feed outside and he knocks on our, win our uh, outside window. No way, they're so smart. Yeah, he'll, he'll knock when he wants food and then we'll just throw like marshmallows and stuff out there and he eats. Oh, that's great. Every day I try to give this guy something crazy and crazy. The latest one is I fed him a whole piece of pizza. He was insanely into it. He was so psyched. <clears throat> okay. Oh, we, we used to give him uh, muffins. He would eat these giant muffins, and I have a, a picture of him smiling at one. It's just so funny. I know. Dude, they're so awesome. I'm, I have to admit, I'm a little raccoon crazy right now. Okay, so I guess we got to get back to work. Um, we got uh, a little under an hour before we do our lab. Uh, and this next hour is going to be real important because I'm going to have to cover many of the things that we're going to be doing in our homework starting on Wednesday. <clears throat> So get ready for a flurry of note time activity here. Let me go to speaker view. Let me full screen myself and uh, let me just clear off the register here. Now, in theory, I will have enough modules to cover all five of our homework problems. Usually I can get through most of them, but since we're going to be doing the homework together, it's going to be okay either way, but let's try to make that goal anyways, just out of principle, okay? So first thing we need to do is we need to learn a little bit about the motion of Earth. And let me get out my globe here. Um, it doesn't seem complicated at first, but you live on a rotating sphere, which is orbiting around the sun. And if you're a little ant organism on this big giant sphere, and you're rotating around in a 24-hour period, the nighttime sky is scrolling over your head in a kind of complex way. So I'm going to introduce you guys to a couple of fancy vocab terms that will help you understand how Earth goes around the sun. The reason we need these vocab terms is because it allows us to have a sort of intelligent conversation with each other about the solar system, how to orient ourselves. So hang on to your hats for a little bit. Um, so let's call this, this module of your notes. Let me get my, I want to get my board really nice and aligned here. Uh, sometimes I've got a karate chop to get the autofocuser in, in, in line here. So this section of our notes will be titled The Orbit of Earth. So let's start with some stuff that you already know. Uh, Earth has an axis spin. Oops, major dyslexia just popping out there. Earth has an axis spin. And during the course of a single day, the Earth will spin on its axis 24 hours. This is something you guys already know. I'm putting a box around this. This thing that I just gave you here is one of the first of many examples of what is called in our course a conversion factor. A conversion factor relates one set of units like days to another set of units like hours. Now look guys, I know y'all know there's 24 hours in a day. If not, you've got some real problems. But the reason why we're writing this down is so that you guys can start to learn the abbreviations that I use for each of these. 
For instance, in addition to Earth's axis spin, Earth also has an orbital rotation. We call it the orbital period of Earth. The orbital period of Earth, it's time to go around the sun, is one year. And of course, one year is 365 days. I'm using the abbreviation little d for days. And I'd like you to do the same as well, both in your notes and in your homeworks. OK. As Earth goes around the sun, um, it makes a quasi-circular orbit. Normally, I try to demonstrate this in class but I don't have the field of view here. So let's take a look at a couple of my slides for, for some extra help here. You guys should be able to see my slides okay here. Okay, um, this is what the orbit of Earth would look like if you could look at it from space from a top-down perspective. From a top-down perspective, Earth is spinning on its axis counterclockwise as seen from the North Pole of space. And Earth is orbiting around the sun in the same orientation. It's also spinning counterclockwise. And this is actually a kind of a big theme of the entire solar system. Of all the planets in the solar system, almost every single one spins. If you look from the North Pole, they all spin counterclockwise in this direction. Uh, we might be flipped right now, let's see. If I spin counterclockwise, yeah, that still looks good on your screen here. So counterclockwise as seen from north, all the planets, and I mean every single planet, every comet, every, well, almost every comet, every asteroid, they all orbit the sun counterclockwise, and almost every planet spins counterclockwise with one exception. And that's not a random coincidence. There's a reason why all the planets are spinning in the same way, it has to do with the way our solar system formed. I don't suppose any of you would take a guess at which planet, there's one planet that spins backwards ever so slightly. Anyone know what planet that is? That's gonna be a big thing in this class. Is it Saturn? Not Saturn, but Venus. Venus is the only planet that spins backwards. The only other exception would be the planet Uranus, which is tilted on its side. We'll get to that in a moment. <clears throat> Okay, so it turns out that, you know, there's no such thing as up or down in space, but we can define north, south, east, and west. And here's how we do that. From now on, anything in the direction of Earth's north pole will be considered north in space. Anything in the direction of the south pole will be considered south in space. East and west is kind of a weird one, right? Because let's look at Earth here. Like here you can see the west coast and here you can see the east coast. And if I'm spinning, spinning counterclockwise, I'm spinning the Earth so that it rotates Rhode Island forward. In other words, this is Rhode Island, and it's pushing forward. Now, Rhode Island is currently on this side. If I flip it around, it'll be like so. And here's a weird thought. If you think about it, if Earth is spinning in the direction of Rhode Island, it's spinning in an easterly, easterly, in an east direction. So this is going to be something that doesn't make a lot of sense, except in an astronomy course. But from now on, we are going to define counterclockwise. Will be defined where I have used the triple equal sign. Triple equals is a math operator that means defined as. So we can't argue about it. At first, you start off by memorizing this fact. And over time, it starts to make good sense to you. Kind of weird. That also means that clockwise is equal to west. So just go with it and believe me, OK? Let me go back to my share screen for a second. <clears throat> OK. Um, We'll come back to this for a moment, but I want to define another vocab term really quick. I want to talk about the ecliptic path and the ecliptic plane. If you were to watch the Earth from the North Pole of our solar system, 
you'd see it going in a counterclockwise direction around the sun as evidenced by this blue ring. The orbit of Earth is wicked close to a perfect circle, but it is not exactly perfect. Technically, the orbits of planets are ellipses, but you all ain't ready for that just yet. From now on, I'm going to lie to you because lies are easier than the truth. I'm going to tell you that the orbit of Earth is a circle. And the circle has a particular name. It's called the ecliptic path. And this is a new $10 vocabulary word that you must memorize with me. Let's do it here. The ecliptic path, and there's two definitions for it. So this is definition number one, is just basically the path of Earth around the sun. Pretty simple concept. The ecliptic path is just that simple blue arrow that I showed you a moment ago. We can also use the ecliptic path to define something called the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic plane is the two-dimensional sort of uh, surface um, <clears throat> made by the ecliptic path, or made by simply the ecliptic. In other words, if that makes any kind of sense to you guys, the ecliptic path is the dark blue arrow that you see me tracing here with, you guys can see my mouse arrow, correct? You see my mouse arrow? Okay. The ecliptic path is the dark blue arrow. The ecliptic plane is the light blue sheet. Now you might wonder why is it such a big deal to have these two vocabulary terms? It's to help you orient yourself in the solar system and talk about it. For instance, it turns out that almost every planet in our solar system is orbits the sun in almost the exact same plane. Now this picture is just a kind of cartoon illustration. It's not real. So they actually aligned all the planets perfectly along the ecliptic plane. But in actuality, the planets have very tiny but significant deviations from the ecliptic plane. For instance, if I were to pop over here to Mr. Google, and if I were to just type in um, inc inclinations of the planets, let me just show you a little image here that gives you a, a cartoon idea. This isn't a great picture, but this picture will do. You can see here that if we define the Earth and the Sun as the ecliptic plane, that the other planets deviate up and down by small amounts. For instance, Mercury is pretty high up from the ecliptic plane. It's seven degrees. Venus is three degrees. Mars is two degrees. Jupiter is one degree. We kind of use the Earth-Sun line as the basis for the ecliptic plane, and all the other planets wobble up and down by a tiny amount. But guys, one or two degrees is not a big deal, so it's kind of a lie to say the planets all orbit in the ecliptic plane, but it's not too much of a lie. They're pretty close. Some dramatic exceptions, Pluto is the per perennial misfit, and Pluto orbits the ecliptic plane by about 20 degrees that makes it more of a freak than the other planets in our solar system. By the way, this picture does not show asteroids, but asteroids do orbit in the ecliptic plane. Comets are more complex. There are two regions of comets, one called the Kuiper Belt and one called the Oort Cloud. Let's just save comets for another day. The point I'm trying to make right now is that the, the importance of the ecliptic plane the importance of the ecliptic, did you guys see all that, by the way? Could you see those planets that I was just showing you? Fudge. I think I shared, I should always share my computer screen. All right, so you, can you see it now? Yeah. All right, yes. so, so while I was narrating, I was pointing to all this, and I realized I shared my PowerPoint, but not my screen, so I should never do that again. So this shows you the inclinations of the planets with respect to the Earth's uh, sun line. Okay, in any case, you get the point, I, I think. Let's go back to that uh, slide here. All right, so let's move forward. Um, now that I've defined the ecliptic plane to you guys, I wanna tell you that there's a second definition of the ecliptic that's a little more complicated. We do not have the luxury of flying above the solar system in our flying saucer. 
most of our life is spent on Earth looking up at the nighttime sky and watching the stars rotate. From an Earth-based reference frame, there's another way to think about the ecliptic. And do you guys see uh, this green line here? This is the second definition of the ecliptic. It's no longer the path that Earth makes around the sun, but it's the path that the sun makes, not during the day, not when it rises in the east and sets in the west, that's different. But each day the sun is drifting against the background stars. And, and let me just show you another picture of that somewhere near slide 51. So here's what's really happening. Earth is orbiting around the sun. But from our perspective, uh, where's that bloody picture? Hold on, guys. Uh, I don't have all the slides memorized. Here we go. If you could watch slide 46, excuse me, function F5, 46. Day after day after day, the sun, the sun makes a slow but steady eastward journey along the background stars. You wouldn't notice this because we keep our clocks by the sun time, not by stars. From our perspective, it seems like the stars are drifting every night. But what's really happening is the sun is shifting by a small number of degrees each day, well, by one degree each day along the ecliptic. And each day throughout the year, the sun is drifting with respect to the background stars. That's why we see different stars up at different times of the year. We can call this path, let me trace it here, this path is also called the ecliptic. It's the path that the sun makes against the background stars. Let's write that down. This is definition number two. path of the sun against the background stars. <clears throat> Does that remind you guys of something from the first part of our lecture? What's that remind you of? We talked about this earlier. Path of the sun against the background stars. Do you remember what that is referring to that we talked about earlier? Is it the astrology premise? Hell yes. Who said that? Where are you? Oh, hi, Megan. Okay, cool. Sorry, I'm just kind of learning you guys. Um, hell yeah, Megan. That's exactly what I, what I wanted you to hear. Let me, sh uh, what I wanted you to say, excuse me. Uh, 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 let me show you. Here's what she's saying, and here's what I'm saying. The ecliptic is the zodiac and the zodiac is the ecliptic right over the course of a year the sun seems to drift through these 13 particular constellations by the way it used to be 12 but the earth goes through some gravitational wobbles from the moon's uh gravitational tug that shifts the path of the ecliptic over 26,000 years oh my god do i want to get into that right now why the hell not the earth undergoes something called a 26,000 year axis precession. Like a top, the earth warbles on its axis over the course of many tens of, sorry, thousands of years. And changing the orientation of earth with respect to the background stars actually changes where the ecliptic is pointed. It's not going to happen significantly in your lifetime, but if you waited several lifetimes, you might start to notice it. Okay, so I'm throwing that out there. Um, the by the way, let's take this as notes because I just made an important point that I don't want you to miss here, okay? The ecliptic, pl the ecliptic plane in some sense is kind of like the plane of the solar system. That's point number one. The solar system is a disk. And another point that I'm trying to make here, besides that, is that the ecliptic is the zodiac 
and the zodiac is the ecliptic. You know, uh, Vishnu wasn't kind enough to humans to paint the ecliptic onto the sky for us. If I'm an actual astronomer, if I want to understand how the sky works, if I go out at night, I look for the zodiacal constellations. I look for Gemini, and I look for Leo, and I look for Capricorn. And when I see those constellations, I know, hey, dog, that's the plane of our solar system. I would always look for Mars in a constellation like Leo or Gemini. I would never look for Mars in Ursa Major. I would never look for Mars in Vulpecula. You just won't find it there. Okay, so now you know a teensy bit about the orbit of Earth. Let's add a little bit more to the stew here. The Earth's orbit or the Earth's spin is not perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic, as this slide here is about to show us. The Earth, if you can look at its orbit here in slide 18, is tilted by the legendary 23.5 degree axis tilt. And you'll notice that as Earth goes around the sun, it kind of keeps that tilt fixed in the same orientation. In other words, if the Earth's axis is tilted sort of like so, as it moves around the sun, it sort of keeps the axis tilted in that same orientation. It doesn't, it doesn't do this, okay? That's weird. It would keep its spin like so, and if, shit, this is hard to do on a computer screen. I'm realizing now why this is tricky. So if this is the marker, Earth kind of keeps its orientation like so as it goes around the marker. And this is the legendary 23.5 degree axis tilt. Students, can I erase up here? We cool? All right. So Earth has an axis tilt. It's 23.5 degrees with respect to the ecliptic plane. You'll notice I'm already using my $10 vocabulary words on you guys. So try to keep your head straight here. It's going to get nutty. <clears throat> okay. This means that as Earth goes around the sun, it makes something that I call the four key points in uh, Earth's orbit. These are four geometrical alignments with the sun. And you've heard of them before. They are called the spring equinox, which occurs roughly around March 21st. The summer solstice occurs around June 21st. The fall or autumnal equinox, uh, that's around September 21st. And then last but not least, the winter solstice, which occurs around December 21st. These days, these are geometrical alignments with Earth's orbit. So let me show you what I mean by that here. <clears throat> Let's go to my share screen. Um, if you guys look here, maybe this picture kind of shows it the best. You'll notice that if the Earth's axis keeps the same orientation, then it kind of makes these different kind of right angles with respect to the sun. For instance, on the day when the, when the Earth, let's say that your faces are the sun for just a second. On the day when the axis tilt is 23.5 degrees, but it's pointed to the perpendicular to you, that's the day when the equator points right towards your eyeballs. And even though the Earth is tilted, you get kind of equal amounts of light in the north and equal amounts of light in the southern hemisphere. Sorry, this is hard to do backwards here and there. On the other hand, as the Earth goes around on the day of the summer solstice, that's when the axis tilt looks somewhat like this. 
you still get most of your light beating down on the northern hemisphere, but you can get some sunlight down here, but it's more directed. On the day of the summer solstice, the 90 degree angle, the 23.5 degree angle points sort of towards the sun, which is you, the observer. So spring equinox, summer solstice, this would be your fall equinox, and this would be your winter solstice, okay? Let's take a look at that diagram again together, because the first time around, I can understand if this is a bit overwhelming. Here's one picture of it. I tried to find two different pictures. These were the best I could find at the time. This one's probably the best here. Let's pretend that you understand me for a second. Here's a pop quiz. Not really, but let's just pretend it is. Can you guys tell me what day of the year we're looking at here in this configuration? Someone take a guess. Would it be December? December 21st. How did you know that this was the winter solstice, Megan? Very good. Because... I know it's always hard to say these things, but try it anyways. Because there's more... I don't know. Yes, yes, keep going. Oh. Keep going. I, really don't, I don't know how to explain it. Yeah, this is, the, this is why we have to learn how to use... So when you guys listen to me, you're listening to, to hear how I use the vocabulary terms. Sometimes you can know a thing, but not be able to explain it. That's where vocab terms come in. The way I would say this, Megan, is I would say, you know it's December because the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. The South Pole is tilted towards the sun. It's clearly not an equinox because you're getting a lot more sunlight in the Southern Hemisphere than you are in the Northern Hemisphere. But anyway, case, I would keep it simple and I'd say, I know it's the winter solstice because the North Pole is pointed away from the sun. Oh, I didn't even see that. Oh, well, somehow you knew what it was, so that's good, all right? And kudos for you for getting it right. Okay, um, we have to talk about a couple of other things really quick. I wanna talk, I wanna go back a couple of slides to talk about the orbit of Earth. The orbit of Earth is close to a perfect circle, but it is not a perfect circle, it's an ellipse. And that means that there's two key points in Earth's orbit, one which is a bit closer to the sun, that's called perihelion, next to Helios, and the other is called aphelion, or opposite Helios. Let's take those notes down together. So introducing the vocabulary term Sorry, I keep fiddling with this bloody thing here. Okay. There is perihelion. That's closest to the sun in orbit. And then there is aphelion. farthest from the sun in orbit. You all can see that, right? Okay. Hey, what time of year do you think perihelion occurs during? What time of year is it at perihelion? If you had to pick a month, what month do you think perihelion occurs in? December. Who said that? Ian, was that you? Or who, who was that? Or is Zach? I, it, it was Nick. Hey. Oh, uh, so, oh, you're trolling. I can't see you, Nick. Or, or oh, are you, you there? Can't see, no, I'm here. I have my camera oh, on. I see, I see you. OK, OK. <laughs> you guys are like a bunch of little windows on the side, so I had to scroll up and down to find you. Oh, yeah, no Nick, worries. Nick, how did you know that perihelion occurs in winter? Well. I don't know. I think I'm going to get it wrong. I just kind of had a hunch and I'll go with that. Wouldn't you expect it to occur in summer? Oh, uh, well, yeah, because it's closest to the sun in orbit, but right. it's not the direction of the North Pole. Uh, it's something a little different than that. So okay. it turns out that you're almost correct, Nick. Perihelion occurs in January 
and aphelion oh. occurs in, in like July. But most people think that perihelion is summer and aphelion is winter, but that doesn't make any sense. The Earth's changing distance between the Earth and the Sun is not significant enough to affect global temperatures. Earth's orbit is so close to a perfect circle that it almost doesn't matter the changing distance between the Earth and the Sun. Um, I'm going to now define something for you guys called an astronomical unit. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Sun and Earth. And I want to use these miles called kilometers. So that might call for a couple of extra notes here. So work. Focus, camera. Okay. Let's try some metric units of length for a second. As this is a enlightened physical science class, we'll be using the metric system. No more of those lame ass miles, okay? So uh, our standard unit of length is the meter. Whose abbreviation is 1m, okay? I've got a meter stick here in my hands. A meter is kind of like a yard, but better. Why? Well, because meters contain, sorry, things like these guys. See this? These are all centimeters. One centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters. A centimeter is about the is about the length of your your index finger pinky nail. Come on. I'm trying to get this stupid bloody camera to focus. So I'd say that your, your, your fingernail is kind of close to a centimeter. Do you guys see those tiny little tick marks in there? Those are millimeters. A millimeter is like, well, it's thin. What's the size of a millimeter? A pinhead. A millimeter is about the size of a pinhead. A centimeter is about the size of your fingernail, okay? Maybe the width of your fingernail is about a centimeter. Okay, so, in a meter stick, a meter uh, is equal to 100 centimeters, and that's also equal to 1,000 millimeters. Those are some good conversion factors to know about. A centimeter is 10 millimeters. This is stuff that you probably should have learned at some point in your life, but now you're going to really learn it. If you want to measure distances around a planet, like the diameter of a planet, we tend to use kilometers. One kilometer is equal to a thousand meters. This is a key conversion factor. You will learn this, you will love this. You're gonna use that probably every day in this class. A kilometer is a thousand meters. Okay, I need to erase this stuff, so could you give me a thumbs up when you're done writing? Ian's cool, Brand's cool, Kayla's cool, Megan, okay, great. I'm erasing, shout at me if you don't like that. I wanna introduce a new concept for you guys, a new unit of measurement. Introducing the astronomical unit otherwise known as 1AU. Its definition is the average distance between Earth and the Sun. And 1AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. Ding, ding, ding. I think we have violated one of the rules of our astronomy class, didn't we? What did I just do there? You didn't put I, it in scientific notation. That's right. Was that you, Brandon? Yes. Get that microphone back on. I, yeah. volu I volunteer you for the job, okay? You've been drafted, son. Uncle Sam needs you to put this into scientific notation. Can you do that? 
wouldn't it be just try it wouldn't it be uh what is it uh would it be 15 to the power of seven no okay hold on or did i get that wrong to the power of seven. Oh no 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 no, no. look 15 times 10 to, to the, the power of seven. yeah times if you do 15 to the power of seven that's yeah. <laughs> this number okay but 15 times wrong. okay look let's start off with what he did this is weird but okay okay what he did is weird, but technically <laughs> speaking, 15 times, did I spell weird right? I before E, except when in German, right? No, it is I. E oh, it is right. Yeah. Dude, this is okay. You could put that into your calculator as 15 EXP7, and you're technically not wrong, but it's weird. What was our lead digit supposed to be? Lead digits are supposed to be between one and nine. What's your lead digit? 15, it was supposed to, okay. Ah, but 15 is not an allowable lead digit, right? A, a lead digit must be the first number in your number, not the first two numbers in your number. So it'd be one. So then the proper form, the proper form would be 1.5 times 10 to the what? Six. No, yeah. then you move your decimal place back there. Oh, uh, eight. Yeah, you move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces. This, my friend, this is called proper form of scientific notation. In your, in your labs today, you will be putting numbers into proper form. For instance, if you were to look up the definition of an AU in the back of your book here, in your appendix, they have a bunch of usual, useful conversion factors. You'll notice the very first one they have there, they put it in proper form. That's how a proper form person does it. 1AU is, we call it 1.5, but they've got 1.496 times 10 to the 8. See that? They're using proper form, Brendan. Now listen, this is okay. This is fine. This is good. I'm so fucking weird. I don't even use proper form. I'm even weirder than a weirdo like you, Brandon. Watch this. I move the decimal place back one, and I like to write 1AU is equal to 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. And this, my friends, this is good math style. You get that? Why would I do such a thing? Does anyone know? Why is that my favorite version? Because then you're only doing groups of three zeros. Exactly. I like to jimmy around my decimal place until my powers of 10 look like a thousand or a million or a billion or a trillion. Because then I can read it off my brain in English. I can read this as 1AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. I'm so deep into this that if I see 10 to the 6, I just think million. You got to admit, that sounds a little better than 1.5. Well, 1.5, how do I say this? <laughs> right, that's 1.500 million kilometers or something. I don't know. That's weird too. All right, look, here, this is, this is 15, 10 million kilometers. It just sounds too messed up, right? Okay, one, 150 million kilometers is the right way to do it. You're gonna see me do that a lot. By the way, you can also put that right into your calculus. Watch my moves. 150, and you do EXP6, and your calculator kind of automatically, oh, okay, the calculator spelled it out for you, but whatever. Okay. Couple more modules here. Let's get back to the game now that you know about, oh, by the way, you might ask me, hey, dude, why do I care about 1AU? What's the importance of 1AU? 
One AU is a new meter stick that you can use to measure out distances in our solar system. For instance, check out my dude, the solar system here. You'll notice that, by the way, anytime there's a number between zero and one, your professor always likes to think of those numbers as percentages. So I would read this number here as 40% of an AU to Mercury. Venus is 70% of an AU. Earth is one AU. Mars is one and a half AU from the sun. Look how crazy the outer solar system is. 5 AU to Jupiter, 10 AU to Saturn, 20 AU to Uranus, 30 AU to Neptune, Pluto is 40 AU. I would say that the entire solar system, edge to edge, if you think of the solar system like a Frisbee, the disk of the solar system is like 100 astronomical units in diameter, approximately. That's kind of cool because it means that any number Anytime you want to memorize the distances to planets, it's much easier in AU than it is in kilometers. Okay, but sometimes we need to know how far things are in kilometers. Are you guys ready to get frisky, do a little math problem with me here? It's time for us to learn how to do math with each other, okay? I've got an important lesson to teach you here. I'm going to ask you a simple question, the kind that I'd expect you to be able to solve, and I'm gonna teach you how I want it done. Here's the question. If Pluto is 40 AU from the sun, how many kilometers is that? Now look, this is what I would consider to be a simple question. And I bet maybe one or two of you out there might even be able to do it. Let's see. Does anyone know how to solve that problem? Like, what if I just gave you an exam right now and it had one question on it? You either got 100 or you got a zero. Can any of you answer this question? Yeah, Zach, what would you do? Uh, multiply the 150 to the, what is it? Times to the 10. Sixth. Yes. Yep. Uh, multiply Five. that by 40. Zach, you're having a good day and you see what to do and you are correct. That would give you the right answer. Now, the way that Zach did it is kind of the, like, I'm smart and I'm times. doing, say that? Yeah. yeah. Yep. No, here you go. Yeah, so, so Zach, the way that you did it is the kind of natural inclination of how one would do it if they saw what to do. And yes, Zach, it would give you the right answer. But I'm here to tell you something different, Zach. I want to teach you a method that's maybe going to seem at first a little more long-winded, but I promise you that if you trust me and you go along with me, this will give you many greater powers than the powers you already have. It's a way to solve any complicated unit conversion problem and it makes many problems that were formerly impossible for you to do, easy to do. I'm using this as an example problem because it's relatively simple. So yes, Zach, that would give you the right answer, but hear me out. I'm gonna teach you some new stuff here today. First thing that I wanna teach you is this, guys. This problem, it's essentially what we call in science, it's a unit conversion problem. And in science class, we have a particular method that allows us to solve very difficult unit conversion problems. The method that we're gonna be using and the big lesson that I'm teaching you here today is something that goes under the name of dimensional analysis. And the whole secret, the genius behind dimensional analysis is that it uses units instead of numbers to solve the problem. And that's different than the way that Zach did it. Because when Zach tried it, Zach said, hey man, I would take the 150 million and I'd multiply it by 40. Notice he made no references to kilometers or AU. The problem is, Zach, that when the problems get more complicated than this, and they will, that method will eventually fail you. Especially when you're dealing with more abstract stuff. Like right now, like kilometers and AU, you can kind of think about. But we're gonna learn about energies. We're gonna be talking about electron volts and joules and this shit's gonna get real weird, okay? So this technique's gonna be very important. Okay, 
Because of its importance, I want us to write down a four-step method of how we solve the problem, and I'll simultaneously show you along the way. So here we go. I have a four-step program for dimensional analysis. They're called the four steps of dimensional analysis. Every, oh, by the way, uh, I wanted to say something. In a unit conversion problem, you're always trying to take some number of one unit, like AUs, and convert it to some other number of units, like kilometers. So that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to convert question mark AUs to question mark kilometers. The first step in dimensional analysis goes like this. Write down the number that you want to convert with its units. So this is how we begin the problem, is we have to identify what is the number we want to convert with its units. Now, I'm going to be erasing up here so you can see me do this as I write down my four steps of dimensional analysis. Class, what number would I write down in this problem with its units? Megan, I think you want to answer this question. You look like a person who's dying to turn on your mic and ask, answer this question. <laughs> Oh, okay. What okay. number would I write down here in this problem? What do you think? Um, let's take a guess and go with 40. But 40, 40. Oh, um, 40 AU. Thank you. That's correct, Megan. You were a good person to call on. Thanks. Okay. Now, let me tell you what to do for step two. Step two is real easy. Step two, we're simply going to multiply by a division bar. And to do this, we're just going to multiply by a division bar like so. You'll do it that way every single time. Now, the third step is the most important step. It's we put the units in first. to cancel. In other words, can I remind the class that even though I've written down 40 AU kind of in the middle of the division bar, that every number is part of a secret fraction, whether you know it or not. And that's because if I wanted to, I could always divide 40 AU by one, and therefore, technically speaking, the 40 AU is currently in the top of my fraction bar. You might not have realized that right away, but I'm here to tell you, if you write a number down, like if you write the number five down, the number five is not simply five. It always can be considered five divided by one. So any number is in intrinsically in the top of a fraction bar unless you put it in the denominator. That means I can cancel out astronomical units by putting AU at the bottom of the fraction bar, and watch this. Watch, watch. I just canceled out my AUs. That's what happens in step three. But also up here, I wanna put the units that I wanna convert into. What units do I wanna to convert to, class? Kilometers. Thank you, so I put those on top. Now step three is done. Zach, you'll notice the big difference between my method and your method is where you talked numbers, I talked units first, right? And it's going to turn out that this is wicked, wicked good for your brain, but you'll have to trust me for the moment. Later on, you will all be convinced of the wisdom of this. Now it's time for the final step for step four. You put the numbers in second using conversion factors. 
oh class, if only I had a conversion factor from AUs to kilometers. What's my conversion factor? You gotta have a conversion factor in your back pocket here. Thoughts? Sorry, Brandon. Sorry, my uh, I thought I was muted. My phone went off. Oh, sure. Well, you guys think about what the conversion factor is. I'm closing the window. One second. Come on, guys. Talk to me here. Does anyone have a conversion factor from AUs to kilometers? Is this too easy or is this too hard? I don't, am I going to, have I broken your spirit banks? I don't know what's going on here. Michaela. Michaela, you're my next victim. Talk to me. So one AU is the scientific method of 150 times 10 to the sixth. Okay, I don't even want 150 times 10 to the sixth kilometers. Yes. Can I teach you how to say that better? What you should have said is, forget about saying scientific method. It's the it's scientific notation. Say, Brendan, where are you? You're not, your little face can't hide from me. I'm going to scroll there. There you are. Okay. It keeps shuffling the people around. Michaela, you would say 1AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. Okay. All right. That's how we talk. Now, Michaela, we're not done yet. One of these numbers needs to go on the top and one of these numbers needs to go on the bottom. Can you intuitively tell me which goes where? Yep. Uh, where? One goes at the bottom of the denominator. Yep. And uh, 150 million would go up top. Beautiful. This is a key point, guys, that we could easily screw up. Always keep your number with the units. That's essential. Okay. We're ready to punch them up. Have you got your calculators with you? or something like it. I'm gonna try an experiment here that we're gonna use for our, uh... hold on a sec guys. I'm gonna try an experiment that we're gonna use for our labs today, shortly. Share screen iPhone. Let's hope no one sends me any embarrassing photos or texts while I'm doing this, okay? But if so, I'll roll with it. Okay, you guys are going to go on mobile cam camera mode here. Cool. Check this out. You see that? Okay. Let's punch this into our screen here. Okay, can you guys see what I'm doing here? Yes? Someone tell me. Uh, yes. Yeah, yes, okay. Yes. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do 40 times 150 exp6 and we don't have to divide by one we could if we want to but that's not necessary equals okay that's my answer and hopefully you see that on your calculators as well am i allowed to write that down onto my paper no why not We have to put it in scientific notation. Good, I recommend you for that job. So how do I write that number down? Um, I didn't get it, I, I didn't see the number on the calculator, but I was still trying to figure it out. Do you have your calculator handy? Oh, kinda. <laughs> so punch it in, do, the point is you guys, hey guys, I can't stress this enough. This is time for a teachable moment. Watching me do shit is gonna teach you all of nothing. You've got to learn math with your pointy finger. You gotta punch the buttons that I punch. This is what's gonna make you smart. You're just gonna have to trust me. I've been doing this longer than you. So Brandon, you got a calc app there, punch it. Oh, did you, it looks like you found something that looks pretty close to the FX260 solar. 
It looks yeah. almost like the same thing. That's super cool. Okay, so type 40 times 150 EXP6, hit equals, and tell me what the number is. All right, so it would be uh, 6. Oh, oh, uh, it would be what six x ten to the nine or yeah, to the ninth power. All right, say that one more time for me. Uh, six x ten to the ninth power. Is that? Uh, yeah, I'd like it if you say six times ten to the ninth. Okay, six, six times. And what are the units? Um, kilometers. All right, put a box around it because that's a classy move. That's how I want your maths to look when you do maths with me, okay? I'm, I'm talking to you all right now. I don't know if your ears are hearing me, but this, well, forget about this one, but uh, Zach, this is what the thing is gonna look like on your homeworks. Do you see that? That's my style. That's the style I need you guys to do for me. And I'm sure, Zach, with time, you'll start to realize why I'm insisting this. By the way, uh, Brandon, how would I say that in plain English? Six times 10 to the nine kilometers. I would say use your chart that I made with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back to the notes. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, Six billion kilometers. Thank you, rescuer. Six <laughs> billion kilometers, because nine is billion. Nicely said. OK, guys. We're kind of out of time, but I need to just squeeze in a couple little more tidbits here. I'm going to have to do them fast. I'll cover them slower next time, but next class we're going to be meeting. Well, we're going to have lab in just a couple of minutes. And the lab is, I'm going to keep it short today. So let me just borrow a few more seconds. Uh, there were three little bits that I didn't get to tell you about. And these three little bits we should kind of talk about so that you'll have a better understanding of what we're doing during our homework session next time. By the way, you'll notice that I didn't rush that bus when it came to dimensional analysis. That technique there that I just showed you, dimensional analysis, you may not have thought that was fun, but that's gonna be one of the single most useful things that I've taught you throughout the entire semester. And I would like to promise you that it is way more powerful than you even understand yet. So I'll be calling on each one of you to practice it with me. I want this to be a collaborative sport. Now, let's go back to my lecture for just a moment here. And you'll remember that back in the day, I was gonna tell you guys about seasons before I got distracted. One of your first homework questions is about seasons here. Now, it turns out that seasons are actually caused by the axis tilt of Earth. They are not caused by the changing distance between Earth and the sun. And y'all might have a question about why that is. Go through imagination land with me here. You all know that light is a form of energy because when you stand in the sunlight, it warms you up. Imagine I had two flashlights with two identical beams of energy. Um, the only difference is one shines straight down at a perpendicular angle. Oops, sorry, something like that. Whereas this other flashlight ray strikes at an oblique angle. Now the diameter of both beams is the same, so the brightness and the energy contained in both diameters is the same, but they strike the ground at different angles. Which patch of ground do you think is gonna end up being warmer? The patch of ground that's on the left or the patch of ground that's on the right? Which is gonna be the warmer patch? Zach points to the left and I'd agree. Zach, can you tell me why, in simple words, this is going to be the warmer patch and that's going to be the less warm patch? Just simple words. Uh. <laughs> I, know, uh. I, I know it's tough. Your intuition is good, but it can be hard to put these things into words, but you must practice. That's part of learning to become a science thinker. I can even start you out. The beams, the width of the beams are equal in terms of their energy, but what's different about left versus right? And while the you think, oh, say that. The tilt. 
the axis? What would be the? We're gonna we're gonna get to the tilt part, but let's just focus on these two flashlights. Why would this ground patch be warmer than the right ground patch? Can anyone else help here? Uh, go ahead, Zach, or anyone who just shout out. Who cares? You can go. Isn't it? It's because it's going directly to the spot where right is kind of more spread out when it comes. Spread out over what? That's correct. Spread out over. You're missing a word here. It has. It's spread out over a larger distance. No, the distance is the same. It's 150 AU. Uh, 150 million kilometers. It's still one AU. This beam and this beam are both traveling one AU, but it's spread out over a larger. Surface. Area. Area. That's right. These beams have equal amounts of energy, but the beam on the left is concentrated in a smaller unit of area. This beam is spread over a larger area. So pound for pound, the left area gets more ground heating. Okay, now let's not lose the thread of this argument. Let me go back here real quick. I want to go back to my winter solstice for a second. Fudge. Shit. Okay. I've got, watch me number them here, six beams. One, two, three, four, five, six. And during the winter solstice, these beams all strike the surface of Earth at different angles. Class, which beam is providing the most effective heating of the ground rock underneath it? Three. That's right because three is striking at a perpendicular angle. This is why on the winter solstice, the location on earth which should get the greatest amount of heating is South America. This is actually the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south latitude. Next week, I'm gonna teach you all about latitudes and longitudes. Okay, but in other words, when it's winter time for us up here, when we're getting only oblique sun rays, it's actually summertime down here in Argentina and Peru, all right? What is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is two words, class. Write this down, these will be our final notes. Seasons are caused by axis tilt. Not distance. And in general, more tilt usually equals more extreme seasons at least up to 90 degrees. After that, it starts to go turn back again. So believe it or not, one of the most extreme seasonal variations in the entire solar system is actually the planet Uranus. The planet Uranus has an almost 90 degree tilt towards the sun. And now I think Uranus takes like 160 years. Wait, the, no. 160 years maybe to go around the sun? Wait, how, what's the orbital period of Uranus again? Orbital period of Uranus is, come on, Google. Oh, it's 84 years. So that means, let's think about this. Half of 80 is 40. For 40 years, only the North Pole of Uranus gets direct sunlight. The Southern Hemisphere is entirely enshrouded in darkness. And then for the next 40 years, only the Southern, sorry, my focus is all messed up here. Only the Southern Hemisphere of the planet gets sunlight. So Uranus is kind of weird because it's tilted on its side. If you think about it, Uranus only has a single day in also 80 years. A, a day on Uranus lasts 80 years, the same length of its year, because it's tilted on its side. Anyways, shit gets weird. Listen, 
I think this officially is going to end our lecture for the day. Um, <clears throat> there were two more modules I didn't get to cover, but we're going to just cover them during our office hours next time. It is now time for lab. So let's talk about how that happens. I'm going to try to, I know these classes are really long and they're difficult to pay attention to for that reason. But that's kind of the nature of a summer course. We all sort of signed up for it willingly. Um, to try to help and make things better, I'm never really going to shortchange you on the lectures because I think those are the most important part. But I will try to keep the labs short and sweet, and I will help you get the points you need to do well in this course. You'll just have to kind of do everything I tell you to do. Um, in the last version of this online course, when I did it in spring, I would tend to stop the recording at this point, and then I would start the recording so that the lab was separate from the lecture. This summer session, I'm gonna try something different. I'm just gonna keep one big long video, lecture and lab. That should help me because at the end of this class, when I stop, it will render the entire video, and then I will just have to upload the video once to YouTube. I'll be uploading them to my YouTube channel, so that if ever you missed something and wanted to go back, since we're doing this live anyways, I think I should might as well just hit the record button. Does that make sense to everyone? I could see that being really important if someone broke their leg and had to go to the doctors. Now, um, is it okay with everyone if I just have it one big long video, lecture and lab? Anyone see any objections to that? Okay, that's gonna make things wicked easy on me. You'll have to scroll around to find them. Now, let me show you uh, some things about that here. Um, if I share my screen with you, if I go to YouTube, my YouTube channel, YouTube, there's a couple of other Brendan Britons. I'll try to put this into the chat log, which one is mine. That's me there. And you'll see that I have some other lectures from my other uh, classes up there. Um, that was from when I was teaching during the spring. Yeah, in theory, you could watch some of them, but I decided that I was not going to cheese out on you guys. Since you paid the full amount, I'm going to give the full lecture every day, just like it was a class. And that way, it's specific to you, you people. But here, this is my YouTube channel link. And I'll try to post these. Let's go to my chat room. Uh, how do I get to the chat? Stop share. Can you guys see that link there? Boom. I just put that in the chat log. That'll be a good reference so that you guys can always catch the lectures later on if you need to. Okay. Um, now it's time to do our lab and here's how we're gonna do that. I'm gonna move y'all. You're coming on a little journey with me here. This worked out pretty well last time. I'm gonna take you over to my desk. Okay. Let me grab calculators and pencils. Okay. And the uh, stupid thing. Now listen, I was trying to make things good for you guys. They, they asked me if I wanted to assign an official lab kit that was gonna cost a bunch of money. And I thought, no way do I want these guys to have to pay more money. Uh, normally in a lab, you need materials, but I've tried to keep it to the most basic and simple of materials. Um, I don't even necessarily need you to buy the lab book. I will just give you copies of particular pages so that you can get them. Does everyone have the handout from the lab section? It was three pages here. They should be pages two, five, two, six, and two, seven. Do you have them handy in some way or other? Uh, I have them on like online, but I don't, I'm not able to print them out right now. Okay, Zach. So can we talk about that configuration? Cause other people will have the same issue. My way of doing it. If I were as a student, like you guys, since I have a printer, I'd probably just print them out. I'd follow along and write down whatever I write down. And then at the end, I would take a cell phone picture and I would upload that to Blackboard. Let's say you're in Zach's case. Zach, you have two options, and you can tell me which one that you think will work best for you. Uh, one option is if you're a digital savvy guy, right? 
then you would sort of, um, hold on, let me share my screen with you. If you're a digitally savvy guy, let me see if I can find the thing here. You'd have a PDF, right, with, with your pages. And Zach, you can sort of type the answers in. Does this let you type things? I don't know. Do you have no, a PDF? I tried getting to a different page to like let me do it, but I won't. Can we open this up and do you guys have Microsoft Word? Let's see if it lets me uh, open this in Microsoft Word. I think you can convert it to Microsoft Word. Watch my moves, dude. Uh, here I go for my labs. And hold on, let me go to view details because I like details. I'm going to try to right click. Let's see what happens if I click open with Word, all right? Word will now convert your PDF to an editable Word document. That sounds good to me. Can you do that, Zach? Uh, I'm trying. Hey, Zach, do you want to know what the simpler procedure is? Yeah. The simpler procedure is you're going to have to write this out by hand and then write the answers down, and then you take a picture of that. So that's the quick and dirty. Okay. Well, in some cases, it'd be quick and dirty. You would write that down. But look, Word did an okay job here. Why is it read only? I don't want read. All right, so mine says read only. So I'm going to file. I'm going to save as labs, uh, lab one, power of 10. Let's see if it works. And now I can edit it. Now, oh, cool. So that worked out for me. Now, listen, Zach, if you're still with me here, I'm talking to you, but I'm also yep. talking to the rest of the class here. Wait, oops. What the shit is going on here? Even this Microsoft Word looks kind of funny. Is this read only? Hmm. So maybe this has copyright protection. I don't really get it. No, I, I got it. I got it to work. Oh, you did? Yeah, with the uh, the word thing, because I can I can type like my name and stuff on it. Good. I had to just go to edit. Now listen, I need to talk to you guys if you're planning on doing this. When you put answers in scientific notation. No one, and I mean no one, has given me bullshit that looks like this. If you do this kind of crap, I am going to get pissed off. If you insist on typing it and you're not going to write it out, you've got to make your scientific notation and your math look real nice, okay? You've got to use an equation editor. And if you don't know how to do that, let me show you how to do that. You go to insert. You go to insert. Then you go to equation and then you do it like that, 5.6. You can do a times up here, and then 10. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna use a script. 5.6 times 10 to the power of five. That's how shit is gonna look, do you understand? See, I need to be able to read this, and I want it to look on the page exactly how it would look if you wrote it down. Do you guys follow me? So Zach, which option do you prefer? Do you prefer to do this and type it with the equation editor? Or do you prefer to write it by hand? Yeah, write it by hand. That works for me. All right, just before we go forward, I just want to make sure that all the people with me here today have a method of doing this. Is there anyone who here who doesn't have this figured out? Esperanza, Tess, Megan, Ryan, Zach, Nick, Michaela, Brandon, Ian? I'm good. I'm just going to write it out. You're going to write it out? That works for me. Ryan, how about you? I'll write it out as well. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll just write it out too. You guys will keep it nice and neat, right? Yeah. Okay. That works for me. Now let me, today is going to be just a little more long winded because I'm kind of, it's our first day together. So there's things, there's ways I want you of doing things. And it's going to take a minute to figure that out. Um, let me start by saying this. For a majority of our labs, there's a couple of tools that it would be a good idea for you guys to have going forward. Obviously, pencils are nice. I prefer pencils because I don't want to see a lot of cross out marks. If you're wicked neat and your handwriting is awesome and you love pens, fine, but it better not look like shit, okay? Turn in stuff to me that looks good like I was your boss. Mostly using pencil will keep it from getting messy. 
Um, I think it's a great idea for you guys to just get a simple ruler that has some gradations in the metric system. So I have some clear rulers from the lab, but a ruler costs like 20 cents. Get yourself a little ruler. And if you want to go app, obviously get your bloody Casio calculator. And if you want to go absolutely ham, which I wouldn't mind if you did, get yourself a nice compass for five or six bucks. Sometimes we'll use compasses, okay? And get yourself a nice protractor. You can sometimes get a set of a, dude, go to job lot. You can get this at job lot probably for five bucks, okay? Just go anywhere and get one of these. But in the future, if you guys could have pencils, rulers, compasses, and protractors, that will go a long way into making this better. Um, I've got like a lot of sunlight on my face, which is making me look like a holy saint. So I'm going to just adjust the blinds here before we go forward. Give me a second. <clears throat> Let's, let's see if that's a little better. Still, yeah, okay. Still a little bright. Okay, I promise you we're about to get started here. Um, a lot of times to do labs, here's what I like to do. I like to take my phone and go into phone mode and then kind of shine down on the paper so you guys can watch me. I know this is a little gimmicky, but I don't have a better idea of how to do online labs. If you guys do, I'm all ears. For now, this works, so just go with me here. I'm gonna share screen, iPhone. I'm gonna go to screen mirroring, be Britain, and boom, okay. And I even have like a little holder. You should be able to see me here and sort of see my phone, hold on. Let me get some good feng shui here. Actually, I think if I take off lock, I might be able to turn it sideways. Let me see if I can get the sideways. Huh. Um, sorry, normally if I rotate the phone, it will go sideways on your screen. Something's going wrong here. Just bear with me. Hmm. All right. Fuck it. I'm just going to hold my hand. Here we go. I'll try to be, hold my hand steady. Normally, if I go sideways, it rotates the whole picture, but it's not happening right now for some reason. Okay, first thing you can do for me, do you see up here where it says name and lab section? Everything you turn into me, put your name first and last, okay? And you guys, I only have astronomy 1010.1 and 10.2, 10, so just put AS1010. Technically, you guys are section 001, but I shouldn't confuse you with summertime too. So can you always put that on all pages that you turn into me? That way I don't get screwed up. Okay. Now, here's the first section. Our first section, let me explain the point of this lab. The point of this lab is to make sure that you guys can do the scientific notation that I taught you about. Unfortunately, astronomy deals with big numbers. If you guys are scientific notation stupid, then we can't even have a simple conversation together. Now, I may have to kind of walk around your little faces, and I kind of want us all to try this, okay? Because that's part of lab is me torturing and terrorizing you. So normally, we only put numbers into scientific notation if they're greater than 1 million. But today, we're going to be putting all numbers into what's called the proper form of scientific notation. Proper form has a single lead digit, followed by a decimal point, followed by some change, times 10 to some power. That's what proper form looks like, okay? We'll probably only keep one or two, in some cases, maybe three sig figs. I'll talk to you about sig figs later. I'm also going to teach you a little bit about measurement and things like that. 
Another purpose of today's class is to learn how to use the EXP key. Brendan was savvy enough to get a calculator that looks pretty similar to ours, which is great. If you have, I noticed, Megan, you had a funky little calculator, right? Wait, who showed me their calculator earlier? It was one of the gals. Not me, but I have okay. the one that you- Sorry, Michaela. Oh, you got that, you got PCAL. Hey, Michaela, can you push, push your calculator up there to the screen? Uh, Michaela, that's an all right calculator. It's a sort of second tier calculator, but you don't have an EXP calculator. Do you know what uh, an EXP button? Do you know what your button is? I have an EE button. That's right. You have an EE button. So some people might have an EE button. Hey, by the way, uh, Brandon, what was the name of that calculator that you downloaded? Uh, let me find out one second. It's called because Real Calc. Was it free? Uh, yeah, it was free, but it was on, um, since I got an Android, it was on oh, the yeah. Android. It's on okay. Real Calc Scientific Calculator. I think Real Calc looks even, I use PCalc. Uh, hold on, let me see here. You guys can see my screen, right? Yep. W way back in the day, I got PCalc. It's okay. I think if you turn it sideways, oh, there we go. I finally got the sideways thing to work. Then you can get all the extra buttons and features and stuff. But anyways, if you have PCalc, that ought to work. You have an EXP key down here, okay? All right, so let me go back to phone mode or camera mode. Okay, guys, let's start with the first one, and here's what I want you to do. Follow along with me. We're going to do 2.0 times 2.8 times 10 to the 5. Now, the book gave us some instructions, but we're not going to do it that way. We're just going to practice using our EXP key. So I want you to follow along with me punching into your calculator, and please try to do this. 2.0 times five, oh, sorry, backspace, 2.8 EXP5. That's what you should see on your calculator. Does some of you have that, Amber? Hello, Amber, you're back. Hi. Hi. Amber, do you have a calculator? Somewhere. <laughs> uh, can you get it or use your phone? It's, guys, you won't learn as much if you watch me do it. I know this sounds stupid, but watching, punching the buttons yourself means something. It really does. Okay, anyways, we're going to put this, all our final answers are going to be in scientific notation. So how do we write this down? Amber, I volunteer you. Okay, Amber, I need to put that in the scientific notation. How do I do it? Uh, it's, isn't it 56 times 10? Uh, to the, to what power? Four. Amber, that would work. Normally that would be okay. But today I want to see if we can do things in proper form where we have a single lead digit between one and nine. So although 56 times 10 to the four is not wrong, it's right. Could you do it so that we have a single lead digit? Could we make it 5.6? Times 10 to what power? Four. Six. Not, not six. Your decimal point started here, right? Yep. Let's count the number of times, and it ends up right there, right? Uh, okay. One. So that'd be five. Three, four, five. Exactly. Okay, everyone, write that down. That's what I want to see, and put a box around it, because that's a classy move. Okay, we'll go in alphabetical order here. Brandon, you begin with a B, so you're next. Brandon, uh, oh, can we talk about the minus six crap for a second here? We gotta have a little sidebar. Scientific notation can be used to write down wicked tiny numbers. Like, let's take a really annoying number, the kind of number that I don't wanna see written down in your paper. Point zero 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 two three four. That's kind of an irritating number to have to look at on the page. To do this, I can make use of what are called negative powers of 10. For instance, you probably forgot this, but in your math class, you know what 10 to the minus one means? It means one over 10 to the one. And one over 10 to the one is a 10th, and a 10th in a decimal form is written like this. We call that one tenth. Let me tell you now about 10 to the minus two. 
10 to the minus 2 is 1 over 10 squared. 1 over 10 squared is a hundredth. And in a decimal form, that's 0, 0.0. That's a hundredth. And maybe you guys are starting to see where I'm going with this. Guess what 10 to the minus 3 is? It's a thousandth or 0 0.001. So what 10 to the minus 3 is, is it means I've got two, a decimal point, two zeros, and the one is in the third place. Negative powers of 10 are tiny numbers. They are not negative numbers. Oh, do you guys see how I always pad my small numbers out with a leading zero? You will always do that as well. Basically, you, you will do whatever I do. I am math Jesus, and you will do this in memory of me, okay? So, uh, by the way, we can use this to write down this number into scientific notation. So Amber, because I was picking on you, Amber, what's my lead digit in this number here? Zero. No, zeros cannot, I'm glad you said that because it's wrong. Zeros cannot be oh. a lead digit. The lead digit is the first number in your number that is not zero. Two. Two, very good. So I'm gonna write that down. And I'm going to keep the 34 cents as change. And Amber, how many times did I move my decimal point? Four. So what's, what am I going to write here then? Times 10 to the... Fourth. No, not fourth, but... <laughs> Negative four. Negative four. That's how I would write that. Okay, we're all learning, that's fine. That's why we're doing this. By the way, guys, ooh, I'm freezing. Sorry, my phone's, bleh. You will never, ever, ever use the minus key. You will always use the negative key. Watch me type that out. 2.34 EXP negative key four, all right? All right. Brandon, you're up, homie. We're doing problem number two together. Let me get a little more light. Okay. It is 5.6 times 0.725 exp minus six. So we got to type that in, right? We got to type that in. Sorry, guys. I'm still figuring out my phone thing here. So 5.6 times 6.725. I'm kind of fast, so you got to watch out for me. EXP minus key six. Hit equals and tell me what you get. Right? I got um, 3.766 to the negative fifth power. Okay, but how am I going to write that down? 3.766. Don't say to the negative fifth, but instead say... Negative fifth? All right, no. <laughs> if, let me explain what I'm saying. If you wrote that down, you have fucked up and you are wrong. Okay, that's not okay. Because look guys, the number 200 in scientific notation is two times 10 to the two, right? But if you write down two to the power of two, guess what two to the power of two is? Oh, I fucked that up. Okay, it's I see. Four. Yeah. I speak math. You need to put the times 10 back in there. So how am I going to write this, dude? Uh, 3.766 times 10 to the negative fifth. That's the point that I'm trying to make. There you go. That's how I, you write that down. Yeah, I, I fucked up. <laughs> okay. It's all right. That's why we're doing this. We're just setting the stage for things. Put a box around it because that's a classy move. My box looks bad because I'm holding my phone here. I've got a million excuses. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out if I can make this awesome in some, oh, here we go. Now it worked. Now it worked. Look at that, huh? You guys see what I'm doing here? I've got this little optical holder here. Okay. Uh, who's next? After B comes uh, Nick. Oh, no, Ian. Ian, you're up, homie. Ian, do you have a calculator to work with or something? 
Uh, you're muted, Ian, but it looks like you're saying you're using your phone. I only got my phone. That's okay. Can you type this in with me? Just give it a whack. Yep. I want you to type 3.77 EXP5 times 4.8 EXP3. And you're going to see some hideousness there, okay? So do I hit EE? Yeah, I'll hold that up to the screen. Closer so I can see what the heck it is. Hold on, let, let me full screen you. Hold, oh, shoot. Is that PCALC that you're working with there? No, it's just the regular one. Hold on. I got to just bear with me, dude. Can uh, Ian, Ian, now you're full screen. Okay. Uh, put, oh, yeah, the double E right next to the one. Do you see the double E? Yeah. That's your man. Yep. Double E. Okay. And then so, I do that by 10? No, no. That includes the 10. Okay. So do 3.77 mm -hmm. double E5. Yep. Times 4.8 double E3. Say that one more time. Yep. Uh, hold on. Uh, just bear with me. I'm trying to share screen here. Watch. 3.77. And then you hit EXP. And then 5. Then times. There's no type in tens anymore, okay? Times 4.8 mm. double E three. And hit equals. Yes. Okay. That number clearly needs to be in scientific notation. So let's walk you through by the numbers, Ian. What's your lead digit? One. All right, so we'll write that down. Put a decimal point after it. Let's keep some change. What do you want to keep there? Uh, I guess 8096. Sure. Right. In the future, let me just give you guys some good habits right now. Why don't we just round off hard and let's just make it 1.8. We could have kept the 096, but screw it. Times 10. Now you've got to tell me what the power is by counting your decimal point places. How many times did you have to move that bad boy? Nine. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's correct, but let me count with you. Uh, yes, I think you're right. Uh, hold on, Ian. I'm just looking for you in my wall of faces here. Ian. Oh, there he is. Okay, Ian, let's count together. Okay. One, two, three, four, three, five, four six, five, six, six seven, seven, eight, seven, nine. Eight, nine. Yep. Awesome. And that's it. We're cruising right along here. Okay, uh, next victim. Um, Nick, you down to play? You want to try this one with your calcy here? 5.29 yeah, sure. EXP3 times 6.7 EXP minus 7. Do you mind just keeping that up there? So I don't have my paper with me right now. I just want to look off that real quick to write it down. My Thank pleasure. you. I'm trying to hold it steady, guys, but it's really hard. Oh, no, no, you're good now. Sorry. Okay, so 5.29 EXP3. Okay, just give me one second. Yep. I know it takes a little bit longer, guys, but each of us practicing it, that's kind of what lab is about, all right? It's got to be hands-on or it's not labby. I've also made today's lab shorter so that I can give you guys the extra TLC and attention that you deserve. Professor, this is what I got. I don't feel focused. That looks pretty good, bud, but we're going to have to put that. Let me see. We're going to have to put that in the scientific notation. So 5.29 yeah, so, EXP3. So what's your lead digit? My lead digit's three. All right. So let's write that down. That's and let's keep some change. Keep, I don't know, keep two digits. Should we round the five, though? So three point, or will we keep it 3.59? If you're going to keep it 3.59, the seven rounds that to zero, and it would be 3.60. That, that's what I thought. Nick, rounding is kind of a special art, and I'm going to have a little lesson on that in just a moment. Okay. What's your power of 10? My power of 10, that would be, well, 
one, two, three. Would it just be, yeah, wait, it's just three, right? Not positive or negative. Three. Three. Oh, negative three, sorry. Because it's a small number, right? Yeah, 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 of course. Cool. Nice. Okay, let's move on to section two. We're going to haul ass now. Um, after Nick comes, oh, sorry, Megan actually came before Nick. I'm having trouble with my vocabulary today. Uh, Megan, can you do um, 9.65 exp3 divide by 2.0? Wait, hold on. Yep. Um, I'm just writing it down. Sure, that's fine. I can go slow with you guys. Okay, 5.6. And you guys can also practice and make sure you're getting the numbers that everyone else is getting. Believe it or not, you will surprise yourself. You'll make mistakes. You don't believe you're capable of it, but you are capable of making mistakes and you will make all of them. That's why we're getting the bugs out of our nugs, okay? Um, divided by... I got 4825. Correct. But today we will put that in scientific notation. Sure. Um... 4.8 times 10 to the second. Uh, careful. 10 to the 2 is a number of order 100. Your decimal place moved 1, 2, 3. To oh, get, right? you're right. Okay. That's all right. That's why we're doing this together. 4.8 times 10 to the 3. This is a number of order 1,000. Okay. Boxing it up is nice for me because that tells me what the final answer is, especially when I'm grading your homework. I can find your answer faster. Okay, here we go. 5.6 EXP5. Oh, sorry. Uh, I think Michaela's up, right? You down to party, Michaela? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So 5.6 EXP5 over 1.6 EXP5. So I don't know if I did it right, but 3.5? That's right, but we need to put this into scientific notation. How the hell would I do that? Oh, by the way, if this was a homework, you would never need to put 3.5 into scientific notation because it's less than a million. But the point of today's exercise, Michaela, is that any number can be put into scientific notation. So what do you think we should do here? Well, it'll be times 10. Always, very good. <laughs> now, you've already got like a good lead digit here, don't you? Yeah. And the decimal point's already behind that lead digit. So how many times did you move the decimal place? Zero. That's our power. And that's kind of the same as saying 3.5 times 1, which is obviously 3.5. But this is how you write down a simple number in scientific notation. All right. Uh, I've done the M's, and now we're moving on to... Uh, Ryan, Ryan, Q R S T. Yes. <laughs> hey, Ryan, care to do uh, 2C for me? Yes. Everyone punch this in because it's time for another lesson. I have a mega lesson coming up here, an important lesson. I'd like you to all type everyone together 3.2 EXP9 over 2.4 EXP5. Can I figure out how to do this in a clever way? I got 1.3 times 10 to the fourth. Yeah, but let's just take a look at what was on your screen for a second. So, shoot. But you are correct. That's what I wanted to hear, Ryan. But I want to show everyone here. 3.2 EXP9 divided by 2.4 EXP5. Do you see that number there? Ryan, how would you say that number if you had to say the whole thing out? Uh, 13,333.5. Three. Now, remember back in the day when you had your math class and, and your math teachers 
let me just go to sideways mode for a second. Remember back in the day when the math teachers would say that you, you kind of put a comma every three and then you'd put three with a line over three forever as if it was infinite numbers of threes? Listen, that's fine for mathematicians who don't have any real work to do. But a scientist is concerned with the art of measurement. And there is no such thing as an infinite number of threes. Now, it turns out that what Ryan did was actually pretty good instinct. He said that we should just round it to 1.3 times 10 to what power? Uh, the fourth. Okay. And that's what I wanted. Keeping two digits is what you do if you, by instinct, okay? Class, it's time for us to have a lesson, a lesson about measurement. Now, every time we do a lab, I like there to be a kind of a big point to the lab. And one of the points is mechanical here. I'm just making sure you guys can punch these numbers in. But there's also an opportunity for a teachable lesson. And today's teachable lesson has to do with the art of measurement. See, what makes science different than other enterprises like art or accounting is that scientists are concerned with measuring things in the physical universe and being able to report those numbers to their friends. And to make these measurements, we often use tools, tools like this here ruler. Rulers have a natural quality to them. Let's take a look at the quality of this ruler and see what it's graded down to. Oh, I shouldn't have. Uh-oh, we're going to have a big problem here. Um, occasionally, Zoom loses the, uh, or the iPhone loses the Zoom. Please come up. Please come up. Otherwise, I'm going to have to reboot my phone, and that's going to suck. Sometimes, for just no fucking reason whatsoever, the, the, the iPhone loses the ability to connect to the internet. It's, a, it's just a weird quirk. Uh, and, and then you have to reboot your phone, which is what I'm doing now. But I'm not going to waste time here. We're going to talk about this. So class, I want to talk. Let's this is not as good as my phone. Do you guys see this ruler here? See what I'm looking at? Yeah, it's focused right now. Good. Those puppies are centimeters. You see one, two, three centimeters graded out on this ruler. Do you see the tiny little tick marks, the little mini hashtags? These are millimeters. Now, every ruler has a quality to which it's graded. This ruler is graded down to the nearest millimeter, although it also can measure in centimeters. For instance, right here, this pinky finger is pointing at 10 centimeters. Can you guys tell me how many millimeters that is? 100 millimeters. Excellent. How many millimeters are graded out on this ruler? 300 millimeters. Almost, but not quite. Let me try to share my iPhone again, see if I fix the prob. 360? Not 360. Come on. All right, this finally worked. Here. Bear with me, students. Bear with me. There are challenges associated with this digital world I'm living in now. All right, there we go. Oh, fuck. This is a dumb ruler. This isn't the damn one I wanted. This is spoiling all my jokes. I want to know how many, uh, see guys, I need to make sure that you can understand millimeters and centimeters. And I've learned this the hard way. I want to know if my pencil point is right there, how many millimeters is that? Oh. That's 30 centimeters. How many millimeters is that? 305. Yeah, right there. That's 305. Because it's one, two, three, four, five tick marks greater. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, 
let, let me just try to, I've got a point to make, but I'm, I'm making it in a very long-winded way. So just bear with me here. Okay, our ruler has centimeter gratings on it. And a centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters. You guys can see that. Another way to say that is to say that, to say that one millimeter is equivalent to 0.1 centimeters. In science, since we measure things with tools, all tools have something called a tolerance. That's what a machinist would call it. And a tolerance is the same concept as precision. Tolerance or precision is the quality of your measurement. It's how careful a measurement did I take. In these laboratories, I will often specify the tolerance to you. For instance, if I asked you to measure something with one of those rulers, I may say that your tolerance is plus or minus one millimeter to the nearest millimeter. And another way to say that same thing is to say that I might want you to measure to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. I want you guys to know that that's the same thing. Often people will put a little plus and minus in front of the number, and that tells you that you're talking about a tolerance. It means my measurement was good enough to the nearest centimeter. Now, oftentimes in the labs, I have students measure their height with a two meter stick. I wasn't smart enough to steal a two meter stick because when the COVID thing went down, I never expected I'd be teaching summer class here off in my home. Let's say I tried to measure myself with a two meter stick and I'm gonna put the phone against my computer here. Can y'all see, wait, you can't see me. Now you can see me. Say I tried to measure my height here with a two meter stick. I'm gonna to try to do a good workman-like job of it. Make sure I've got the centimeters on the right side, okay? And I guess I'll get a ruler so I can go over to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. And I'm gonna attempt, look, I'm gonna measure myself to the limit of what this tool can handle. I'm gonna to try to take a good quality measurement of my height. So I'll go across right here and I'm gonna clamp down at the nearest millimeter mark. So I'm at 100, sorry, 100 centimeters, 110, 178.2. That's what I got. And I want you to just kind of watch that number with me for a second. I just took a measurement of myself and I found out that I was 178, 0.2 centimeters. Any person that comes along later and looks at this number will automatically know something about the quality of the measurements that I took. They'll say, check out homeboy over here. My homie did a good workmanlike job and this guy took the time to measure himself to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. He's really pushed that ruler to the limit of its uh, ability to measure. In fact, one could say that each one of these numbers conveys meaningful information about how tall I am. 100 centimeters means I'm taller than a munchkin, okay? And this means I'm two centimeters short of 180. Uh, I'm closer to 178, but if you really go down to the nearest little millimeter tick mark, I'm not just 178, but I'm actually two tick marks above the nearest tick mark. In other words, each one of these numbers conveys meaning about my height. And therefore, a scientist would say that this number contains four significant figures. That's one way to look at precision, okay? Now, another way to think about this, now here's how a physicist would look at this number. A physicist would say that this number has a one part in 1,000 precision. And the logic behind a part in 1,000 is, if you measure to a dime out of 200 bucks or a dime to 100 bucks, that's the same thing as measuring to a dollar out of a thousand bucks. You've broken this measurement into a thousand parts and measured to the nearest part. That's kind of a weird way of thinking about things, but you need to learn this. One of the interesting things about measuring to this level of precision is that any microscopic fluctuation in your technique can change the measurement. 
So let's say that I tried to do it again in the exact same way. Let's see what I get this time. This is a lot smoother when we're doing it in lab together than this bullshit. But here I go. <laughs> hundred and seventy seven point seven weird hundred and seventy seven point seven bloody hell I had a hundred and seventy eight point two centimeters I measured myself again and I got a hundred and seventy seven point seven centimeters class both of these were valid measurements I'm starting to get a philosophical uh, terror here. What is the truth about how tall I am? Am I truly 178.2 or am I actually 177.7? What's the truth? I don't know what the truth is anymore. What's the truth? How tall am I really? Isn't there one truth? Isn't there one singular truth and I can only be one height? I didn't grow or shrink between measurements. At least I don't think I did. What's the reality? Does anyone understand the moral of my story here? What's the moral of them? Does anyone understand anything? What's your name? What's your favorite color? Are there any questions that you do know the answers to? <laughs> what if you my... like? Oh, yeah. Well, go ahead. There's no exact measurement. Or... But I must be some height, right? Shouldn't yeah. I be some tall? Like, how does a scientist discover the truth through measurement? If there is one height, which I am, and the two valid measurements produce different numbers, okay, here's the problem. Wouldn't you just take the average? Like, isn't that what they normally do? Yeah, okay. So, in reality, this is part of the problem of science itself. Measurement is an art which is limited by the skills of the artiste, the scientist, his or herself, who must take the measurement. It's partially limited by the tools. It's partially limited by your skill. But all measurements contain something called random errors. That means you're always gonna be fucking up a little bit. Sometimes in signal processing, it's called the noise. The noise floor is what scientists are always battling against. To be honest, if I was gonna be 100% sure that I'd get the right answer, I would not just take two measurements and take the average, I'd have to measure myself an infinite number of times and then take the average. But that would be effing crazy, right? We're gonna be here all week. Um, I'm starting to think that even three measurements is too much for me. So this is the difference between the parent population and the sample population in statistics. The parent population means to get the truth, I'd have to measure myself an infinite number of times and take that average, but fuck that noise, quite literally, okay? Instead, I'm gonna be lazy and take a sample population, which in this case is two, and then we'll take the average. So let's go ahead and dutifully take the average of these two numbers. So 178.2 plus 177.7, then I hit equals, and then I divide by two. Look at that number. Now let's say you're a good little Nazi and you just wrote that number down because that's what the calculator told you to do. Uh, you would be a liar. You would be a person who didn't understand anything about the art of measurement because you did not measure yourself to the nearest hundredth of a centimeter. You only measured yourself to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. And this is the moral of the story that I'm trying to get. Just because your calculator spits out numbers like fives and sixes and twos doesn't mean that those numbers have anything to do with reality. What should I round my height to, guys, if I were to do this correctly? Maybe 178? No. Oh, close, but not. 178, my friend, has only th three significant figures. And that means you've thrown away some of my hard work because I took the time to measure myself to four sig figs. In computer science, we have a phrase. Garbage in equals garbage out. 
If the measurements each had four sig figs, I should keep four sig figs. How can I round that number to four sig figs? Does anyone know what to do? Oh, would it be 178.0? Booyah, because the five rounds us up to zero. Yes, that's what you should do. Here's the truth, uh, what we think is the truth about my height anyways. The truth is that I'm 178 centimeters tall, which as the ladies like to point out is not quite six feet, okay? At least I don't think it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, some, one of my ex-girlfriends saw that I had put six feet on my driver's license. She went, that's not true. You're five and 11. Taken down by a peg, right? Okay, anyways. So 178.0. Do you guys see the point that I'm trying to make? Now, let's see what's cool about scientific notation. Scientific notation strips away the useless numbers and keeps the ones that are significant. For instance, do you see the number 200? The number 200 only has one significant figure. The number 220 has two significant figures. The number of 222 has three significant figures. In scientific notation, it tends to get rid of the numbers that aren't significant and keeps the ones that are. 200 is two times 10 to the two. 220 is 2.2 times 10 to the two. And 222 is 2.22 times 10 to the 2. Okay, class, let's look back here at 2C and let's see how Ryan did. Ryan, how many sig figs does my top number have? Two. That's right. The 3 and the 2 are significant. How many digits does my bottom number have? 2 as well. So how many do I get to keep in my answer? Two. So what did you round that off to? You did it correctly, believe it or not. 1.3 times 10 to the four. This part of the number here, that part is the precision. That tells you the quality of the measurement in science. Okay, we're all ready to do 1D together, okay? Ready to go? Let's type all this into our calculators. Let's, uh, I guess, Tess, you're up, kiddo. Oh, I forgot about Amber. Amber, you hid on me. You were trolling, but I'll be getting you later. Don't you worry. Amber, I'm coming for you. But for now, Tess, you're my victim. Can you plug these numbers in? Yep. Point nine nine seven nine two. EXP eight divided by 5.520 exp negative key seven hit equals and tell me what you get 5.43 and then all that shit times 10 to the 14 right yes okay Tess, let's talk about rounding with style how many sig figs did your top number have it has you count this one too by the way you cut the lead six down. that's mm -hmm. right your number has one, two, three, four, five, six sig figs. How many does the bottom have? Four. So how many do you get to keep in your answer? Four. That's right. Very good. You go with the crappier number. The crappier measurement pollutes your answer. So what should my final answer be then? It should be five point. You're doing it. You got it. Four, three, zero, zero. Would that be correct? No, 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 no. Go Round further out. out. This is your four digits. One, two, three, four. And that's a zero, so we don't... Shit, you're miss. Oh, I'm frozen. Ah! This is no time for freezes. Hold on, let me stop share. I don't know what's going on. Um, technical glitches are going to be part of the fun of this online class with me, okay? It's loading. It's irritating me. It's loading. Fucking A, we're so close to the end here. Look. Hold on, Tess. 
In the meantime, while I was dealing with my glitches, do you understand the point that I'm trying to make here? So we, are you saying that we don't include the zeros that are in it? The rounding, is that what you were trying to say? We only include, uh, I hate my life right now. Okay, sorry guys. What we include is limit, the quality of the inputs limit the quality of the outputs. Your limiting precision Fuck this camera is 5.520 for significant figures. The times 10 is not part of the precision. I want you to, what I want is for you to just tell me what the final answer is, but I don't want to tell you. I want you to tell me because then you're learning. Does that make sense? Probably mm -hmm. not. Okay. Well, when I first did it, I originally had 5.4 times 10 to the 23rd. Well, but clearly I, that's wacky, right? Yeah. Well, I think I got my mojo back here. I wonder if my internet is acting funny. Remember how it froze? Oh, this is no time. Oh, you know what? Screw this. I got a better idea. You know what? Picking you up. Taking you with me. Okay, here we go. Why didn't I think about this like an hour ago? This also has an autofocus feature. Can you guys see everything here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. So look, this is the number that you have on your thing. You clearly can keep four significant. First of all, I don't know what that 23rd nonsense was all about. Can we try that one more time? 2.99, watch me do it, 792, exp8, divided by 5.520, exp negative seven. Maybe you forgot the, I don't, honestly, I don't know what the hell you did, but you did something weird. Do you have that, Tess? Where are you, Tess? I'm hunting. I do. Okay. So what should my final does what should my final answer be then? If I'm honest. Five point four three one. <laughs> yes. Five point four three one zero. Uh uh uh. I'll have to include the zero. If you put a zero there, that's five sig figs. Sorry, I'm having trouble oh, focusing okay. this. Maybe if I get it steady. I, I will figure this out eventually, but I'm still learning. Oh, here we go. Now if I can just get this bugger to focus. Honestly, the autofocus in this camera is a huge curse because it, it doesn't do it, it doesn't work right. There we go. Okay, Tess, you can't include the zero because five, four, three, and one are four significant figures. Come on, you bastard, focus. What is focused right now? So your final answer should be 5.431 times 10 to the 14th. Can we all just agree with that? Yes. All right. Yes. You guys so are we, probably like, shut the F up and get this over with. I get it, okay? So I'm the reason to... that I had gotten 23 is because I took the 14, but I added the rest of those digits that were in the... No. Number. This so that's that's already already scientific notation. If you see that little power up there, it means that your homeboy is already in scientific notation and you don't have to do a thing. They just don't give you the times 10. So just write it 5.431 times 10 to the 14. The lesson I was trying to get through is which numbers we can keep and which ones we avoid. Okay. All right. Listen, there were supposed to be other parts to this lab, but I'm going to I'm going to call it here because I want to take a minute or two to tell us how we end lab. And you guys have already been awesome today. You've listened to me talk and that in itself is a virtue. <laughs> so all you really have, I planned on us doing three sheets. You had one bloody sheet. Okay. <laughs> that ought to make things easy. Are you all with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now listen, Let's talk about how we end this class and what I need from you. This is where points and things come into it. So listen up. 
Um, you've got a piece of paper and some of you like Zach and Megan just wrote, Zach and Megan, I imagine that you wrote all this down as you went, right? Good. Yes. There may be some days where that's difficult to do, but hope today it worked out. So for most of you, what you'll do is you'll take your cell phones, you'll take a picture, but uh, let's just see, many of you people who have fancy new phones, your phones are going to try to record it in an HEIC format. I have an iPhone and in the, my iPhone's so old it doesn't do this, but in the iPhone, you have to go to your settings and then you have to go to your camera, settings, camera, and somewhere in your settings for camera, there's an option to make it most compatible or to make it high definition. You want to go to most compatible, which should make it a JPEG because a JPEG is what you can upload to Blackboard. Once you have a photo of that single page, here's what you're going to do just after we end on class. Watch me. On the share screen, you are going to go to Blackboard. Can you guys see this here? Yes. Yeah. Um, you go to the lab section and um, you click obviously on lab one and you're going to have to submit it here under browse computer. Then you call up your picture, whatever it is. Now you can upload JPEGs or PDFs. Here's how you know if you did it right. Let's try a sample. Do you see how when I, oh, sorry, I'm in professor mode. You guys are on student mode. But if you get it right, you should see a little preview. Let me try to do this in, let me go back to student mode. I can kind of see a preview of what you guys see. If I go up here, I can click student view and you guys will see, sorry, not homework, lab, lab one. Let's pretend like I'm uploading my, my image here. Browse computer. I'm just going to upload the chapter two questions and see if it shows you a little. Blackboard's notoriously finicky, so. That was not what I was expecting. I was expecting to see a preview. I think you should see a preview. The other students have told me that you can see like a little preview of the picture. That's how you know you got it right. Okay. Anyways, do you think you guys can figure it out? Yes. Okay. You're going to upload that today and you did all the same problems that I did. So you'll all get 10 out of 10 points. Sound good to you all? Yes. Awesome. We're going to kind of do the homework. I promise this will get a little smoother as we go forward. The first class, there's a lot of me yapping as I kind of set the tones for things I want. Here's the big issue. You have a homework due next class. Rather than try to do it tonight on your own, rather than trying to do it tomorrow when you've got other shit going on, can we all just agree that we're going to meet around 10 o'clock and we'll do it right before class starts? We'll just all yes. do the homework together and that'll be great. While it adds two more hours to our day, think of it as two hours you do not have to do any homework at night. And I think we're all probably on the same zone on that, right? Yep. Okay. I'll try to send you the link pretty close to 10 a.m. If I'm a little late, just be patient and wait for me. I'm notoriously tardy, but I'm going to try for the first day to pretend like I'm responsible and I'll try to send you that link a little before 10 o'clock. We'll do our homework, we'll do a lecture, and we'll do another lab uh, that should, they'll all be loaded up for you. Okay, so I think that's everything. Can you guys think of, uh, thank you so much for being a part of this class. Thank you for sharing your faces with me. It's nice to see you and to know that you're humans on the other side of the internet. Um, can you guys think of anything else that we need to talk about or any questions you might have? All right. I'll try to make sure we can get done by four o'clock every day. That way you can have some time to chill before dinner. Um, awesome. Does everyone promise to submit that before next time? I'll try to grade them before next time if you do. It only takes a minute or two. Make sure it says submission completed. It okay. works. It, it works on the phone. I just submitted it to you. So oh. it, you can take it right from your um, phone, 
like it, it gives you an option to take the picture in the submit button. So I just took, did it like that. Hey guys, before you go, let's just check and see if Brandon's, I want you guys to see what I see so that you understand what I'm going through on my end. So let's get the hell out of student preview. Uh, continue. And when I grade your papes, I go over to grade center and I have a needs grading button and I've got one total item to grade. Now let's click on Brandon's and let's see how, if it worked out. Grade all users. Okay. Did mine too. Okay, cool. Do you guys see how Brendan's, you can actually see the preview in the picture? That means he did right and he did not screw up. So I'll be able to quickly grade this and give you your points. Guys, if you don't see that little preview, something's weird. So make sure you see it, okay? And and who else said that? Who else is talking to me here? I did mine, um, but I don't know if it went through. Uh, I'm just trying to find your, is that Tess or who's talking to me? Megan. Oh, sorry, Megan. Megan, let's see if we got it. So let's go to the uh, greater center. Yeah, here you are. Oh, sorry, Esperanza did hers too. Yep, Esperanza, that looks awesome. Am I saying that right? Probably not. Esperanza, yeah, okay. Okay, guys, that's it. Oh, look, you guys are all great. Tess, I know this is silly, but I had a lot of problems last semester with people. All right, PDF, Tess, that looks freaking awesome. I just need to be able to see these when I log in. Otherwise, I'm gonna write you guys grouchy emails. Ryan, looking awesome. Uh, okay, anyways, that's looking cool. So I will see you guys 10 a.m. on Wednesday. Welcome to the class. Email me with problems. I'm stopping the recording.